This is Duke University. Let, let me welcome you all to this seminar, which is part of our celebration of Constitution Day. Uh, I'm Michael Gillespie, a professor of political science and philosophy. I'm also the director of uh, the Duke's program in American Values and Institutions. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to thank the Jack Miller Center for sponsoring this event. Uh, I would also like to thank the John Hope Franklin um, Humanities Center for their help in hosting the event. Um, and my special thanks to my colleague, Nora Hannigan, who was greeting many of you as you came in. She's the associate director for our center and has been taking the lead in organizing our event. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, with us today uh, Gordon Wood, who is the Alva O. Way University Professor and Professor of History Emeritus at Brown University. Uh, Gordon received his BA degree from Tufts and his PhD from Harvard. He taught at Harvard and Michigan before joining the Brown faculty in 1969. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including The Creation of the American Republic, 1776 to 1787, which won the Bancroft Prize and the John H. Dunning Prize in 1970, uh, The Radicalization of the American Revolution, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History and the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize in 1993, The Americanization of Benjamin Franklin, which was awarded the Julia Award Howe Prize in 2005, uh, Revolutionary Characters, What Made the Founders Different, uh, The Purpose of the Past, Reflections on the Use of History, and The Empire of Liberty, A History of the Early Republic, 1789 to 1815, which was published in October 2009, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Professor Wood is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and in 2011, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. Um, uh, just on a personal note, I first encountered Gordon's work my first year in graduate school when I read with great care and awe his creation of the American Republic. Uh, so we, we met a number of years later at a conference in California, um, and they made the terrible mistake at that time of giving us rental cars to drive to dinner, and I was driving home, uh, let's say, with not entirely in my full senses, and uh, <clears throat> Professor Wood was sitting beside me, Lance Banning and Pauline Mayer were in the back seat, and we got lost in West LA somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember pulling up to a service station, and uh, Gordon got out to go in and get directions for us, and after about 10 minutes, he came back, and I said, so which way do we go? And he said, you know, I'm not sure. We tried five different languages, but we, uh, <clears throat> we couldn't communicate. Um, <clears throat> It's really an honor and a pleasure for, for, for us to have him here today. Let me uh, also say a few words about the mechanics of the seminar. Uh, I know that many of you have read one or, or many more of, of Professor Wood's books. Uh, I assume that everyone here has at least watched the videos uh, that we, we sent out to you. Uh, I'm going to begin by posing a few questions for Professor Wood to get us started, and we will then move on to general discussion. Since this is all being recorded, we're going, we have this microphone to pass around, and uh, there's a little button on the side that I'm told uh, I need to push off when I'm not talking, and, and when I'm passing it around, if, if you'll push it off, it's the button on the right, on the left side of the, uh, of the, of the microphone when you talk so, we, so everyone can hear you, and it will go into the recording. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I'm going to keep a list of people that want to ask questions so that if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, I'll put you on my list and try to keep it as, as, uh, as straightforwardly as I can. If you have a question that is directly relevant to the topic uh, under discussion, please give me a, a, some kind of this kind of thing for a short, a short intervention and not a, 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 a long discursive question. Uh, <clears throat> Um, we're going to break at about 3.20 for uh, coffee and, and snacks, and then we'll come back and go on until 5. Uh, I'd like to ask you all to please turn off the sounds on your cell phones uh, so that you don't embarrass yourselves. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we'd all like to know what your ringtone is, but I'm sure you probably don't want us to know that. Uh, restrooms for those uh, of importance down the hall on the left. Um, anyway. So let, let me uh, begin with a few questions for, uh, for Gordon. Um, as many of you, or maybe most of you, probably know, uh, 
there was another Anglo-American country that was considering independence uh, <clears throat> literally yesterday. <laughs> uh, and they decided, uh, no, not to uh, separate themselves from Great Britain. Um, <clears throat> And the uh, interesting title of the campaign to stay with Great, uh, to stay as, as part of the United Kingdom was the Better Together campaign. <laughs> and uh, so I think one of the questions I'd like to, to start with asking uh, uh, Gordon is whether, in fact, uh, uh, America wouldn't have been better together with Great Britain, and and what are the, um, you know, what what are the what are the arguments on both sides of that? Uh, what does it mean, I even if we are better off, better in what sense? What was lost uh, by separation, and um, you know what the consequences have been uh, for that over time? So we'll we'll start with that question. Well, that's not really a historian's question. Um, speculating what would have it been like if there had been uh, no revolution. I, I think it was in the cards, if, if that's the way to put it. Um, I think sooner or later, the, uh, the American colonies were going to have to break away or reach some kind of uh, accord because they were growing fast, faster than England, faster than any other country in the Western world, doubling its population every 20 years or so. So sooner or later, and they had an awareness of that sooner or later, because Franklin had published something in the mid-century pointing this out. Sooner or later, the Americans knew if the British w were going to treat them in accordance with their uh, new status, that uh, either they, they had to be given a great deal of more autonomy or, 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 or would become independent, I think. It didn't have to happen then. And, and that's where, the, the, I think, the British officials uh, messed up. Uh, they didn't take the view that David Cameron did, practically offering the Scots everything that they, they wanted short of, of uh, uh, independence. Uh, they didn't do that. Too late. They finally did in 1778 with the Carlisle Commission. They offered the, the Americans what they had wanted in 1775. And if they had, wanted, if they had offered it in 1775, I think uh, the revolution would have certainly been postponed or, or, or put off whether uh, the two sides of the Atlantic would have gone on and, and made some kind of collaborative arrangement similar to what you had it, with Canada uh, is hard to predict. I mean, Canada was small, a puny. Uh, there's, it wasn't until the middle of the, uh, of the 19th century that uh, Canada got some kind of recognition for its autonomy with the North America Act. Um, so. They weren't, they weren't comparable. By that time, America was already uh, a major power, uh, the, 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 the power that fought the Civil War. So uh, it seems to me that sooner or later there would have been some kind of break, and the British government would have had to have come to terms with this new growing Goliath. Uh, but they didn't have to, it didn't have to happen in the 1760s and 70s. That, that, that much I would. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do you think would have uh, been the, um, the, the consequence? I mean, in a way, with, the, with independence and the, and the Articles of Confederation, we really had a confederation that looks much more like um, East, well, let's say, old, the, the, German, the German states before the Napoleonic Wars. It, 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 you mean under the Articles? Right, under the Articles of Confederation. No, the Articles are, are, you have to keep in mind, they're not an early version of the Constitution. It's a, it's a treaty um, among 13 independent states to come together to do some common things, very similar to the EU uh, in that respect. And people thought of their, I mean, Jefferson talked about my country, he meant Virginia. And when uh, uh, John Adams talked about his country, he meant Massachusetts. So getting together in this, um, these articles, they were, and they, they weren't ratified until March of, 19, of uh, 1781, which is only six months before the Battle of Yorktown, which effectively ended the war. So for a long time during the whole war, the Articles, uh, the Confederation was operating without any kind of legitimacy, uh, just a promise uh, that, that was only fulfilled with the ratification in, in, in March of 81. Uh, 
so it's a, it's a very different kind of thing from the Constitution. And I think the interesting historical question, which we really haven't fully answered, I, I don't believe, uh, is what happened in that decade to create such a change of thinking? Uh, in 1776, no one, and I mean no one, in his wildest imaginations conceived of the kind of state that was created by the Constitution 10 years later. So something awesome or awful had to happen. Uh, it wasn't just because the articles weren't working or they weren't, didn't have a taxing power. That, that, had, that was not what created the Constitution. So you need to explain that. And I don't think it's, uh, most historians take it for granted. And most, I think, Americans collapse the 10 years between 1776 and 1787. They scarcely realize that it was a true critical period. Uh, and uh, what happened had to be serious enough to get people to change their minds in a fundamental way. Uh, a totally change of mind, because I, as I say, I know of no one who could have predicted or did predict the kind of constitution that emerged in, in a decade later. Do you think that the, the smaller republics would have, would have survived without the constitution? Was it, was it a necessary step for us to take? No, I think the articles, if, you know, it was in the cards by 1786, I would say almost all of the political nation, and I, I mean people who later became anti-federalists, opponents of the Constitution, were willing to add uh, two amendments to the, to the articles. That is, uh, give it some kind of taxing power and, and the power to uh, regulate trade, uh, inter international, interstate trade. Uh, they, those are the two things it lacked. Now you have to understand the Articles created a Congress which is a substitute for the Crown. And the two things that the Crown can't do, the Crown couldn't do uh, through prerogative power, was tax or regulate trade. It could go to war, it could declare war, fight war, print currency, do a whole lot of things just with prerogative power. The King had that kind of prerogative power, but it couldn't tax and it couldn't regulate the trade. That's why the Congress lacked those two powers. And now, I think by 1786, everyone, and I mean everyone, I don't know of anybody who really, it, there were a little fights back and forth. Rhode Island turned it down, but then was convinced to join, and then New York got, but sooner or later, within a year or so, there were, those two uh, powers would have been added. In fact, when the Congress meets to authorize the meeting in May, they assume, and everyone else assumed, that this convention is going to meet and add those two powers to the Confederation. Now, uh, Madison had other plans. In effect, I put it bluntly, he hijacked this reform movement and turned it into something very, very different. He didn't reform the Articles, he scrapped them. He and his colleagues who shared his view. Uh, so it's a... Uh, you could say, uh, a kind of coup. Um, they had authorization, but they weren't authorized to do what they did. Uh, they had, were authorized by the Congress, belatedly, to, uh, to reform the Articles, not to scrap them, not to do away with them. So something awful happened in that decade, and that's, uh, I think, uh, a decade that when John Fisk wrote his book, 100 years after the Constitution, 1888, called The Critical Period of American History, he has this famous quotation, this is the mo this five years following the, the peace is, is the most critical period in the whole history of the United States. This is written in the aftermath of the Civil War. And yet Fisk felt, and I think rightly so, that something really awesome happened or awful happened in that, dec in that decade to change people's minds. And that's, uh, that's an issue that I'm, I've always been fascinated with. To put it bluntly, it was the excessive democracy in the states. Now, I, I have to say, uh, it's hard for people to believe. And, and uh, Ed Morgan, but Ed Morgan told me uh, shortly before he died, uh, he just said to me, he says, you know, I think I'm finally coming around to your view of the 80s. And uh, that was a great comfort to me. Uh, because it, it's hard to get people to believe that. They just assumed that, of course, the articles were not working well, and therefore we had to change things. And so the Constitution becomes a, no, kind, of a kind of normal 
response to that, but if you think about it, it's not a normal response at all. Well, and, and many people may know that uh, when, when the Constitution was sent out for ratification to the various states, it, it was almost immediately in trouble. Uh, and it was saved in a way by a, the notion of the conciliatory position, which was uh, aimed to, which was a promise to add more amendments to the Constitution to delimit national powers. Uh, it was, and it's least arguable that, that many of the most important limitations never were put in to the, that's right. into the Constitution. So it, it, it looks even more in that sense from your point of view like a, like a conspiracy, a hijacking? Of well, no, that, Madison's very shrewd and he, he, he wants this to have uh, what, of course, the EU doesn't have, some kind of ratification, popular ratification. He was crucial, that was crucial for him. He wanted it sent out to conventions in each state. He wanted something other than the state legislature to do, the each state legislature to do the ratifying uh, for various reasons. He wanted to, it to rest on something other than the authority of the state legislatures, which of course in his mind were the source of all the problems in the country. Uh, so uh, he had planned for that. And, and you know, when you think about it, the EU has been unable to sink any roots into the popular force. When they, they did draw up a constitution, you know, in 2005, they met for a year, it was open. I think President Destang uh, was elected president. He thought he was gonna be the George Washington of Europe. Uh, and they came up with a constitution, they sent it out for ratification, and the French and the Dutch turned it down. And this, of course, with two of the original EU states, this became, this was panic. So they pulled it back. Uh, and uh, turned it into a treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon. But a treaty can be made and ratified by the state legislatures. It wasn't popular ratification. Uh, the Irish, of course, in their innocence, went ahead and, and voted it down, and this caused no end of trouble because you need unanimous support for the EU. Uh, and then the other governments just put pressure on Ireland. They did it again, and it passed. Uh, but the EU has never been able to put roots, and, and Madison was keen on that. He said, we've got to sink this in the, popular, uh, in, in, the popular, in the population and have them consent to it, because it'll give it a, a legitimacy uh, that it otherwise wouldn't have. So he, that was important to him. Now, the Bill of Rights business, it's an awkward, it's a strange thing. Uh, it comes from Jefferson. He's Jefferson's, Madison sends, uh, Jefferson, the, a copy of the Constitution, in, as soon as they could release it, after September 17th, it was open to the public, and, and he sends a copy to, to Jefferson, along with a long letter explaining his rationale for what he was doing. Uh, really detailed, October of 87, it, it's an interesting letter. Uh, it, it goes right by Jefferson. He never understands what Madison's doing. He never figures out. Madison's very depressed because he's lost two of his major points, which is one is the negative, that the Congress was going, uh, that the new Congress, by bicameral Congress, is going to have over all state laws. I mean, think about that. That gives you some sense of, uh, I mean, Madison was a fairly shrewd politician, but the impracticality of that just boggles the mind. I mean, think of it. It would mean that every state would have to send its bills not, they're not law, bills to the Congress to get okay before they became law. Well, if that had stayed in, uh, you can imagine this 50 states sending their bills in to the Congress be holding hearings on, on the 50 states. Well, the, the pr impracticality was such that his colleagues finally talked him into uh, an alternative. But it stayed in, in the Virginia plan for quite a while. Uh, he, it was finally uh, substituted Article 1, Section 10, which is, you know, is a series of prohibitions on the states, uh, mainly prohibiting them from doing the things that Madison uh, most disliked, which are summarized in his famous essay, Vices of the Political System of the United States. And at any rate, he sends this to Jefferson. Jefferson uh, doesn't fully understand what Madison is doing, uh, but he writes back and says, look, I, this is fine, it sounds pretty good, but I don't like two things. One is the president is eligible to be reelected for life, and that's what's going to happen. We're going to have a Polish king. Uh, and th there's no Bill of Rights. And then he goes on to explain, look, my French friends uh, expect any constitution to have a Bill of Rights, and, and he's kind of embarrassed that his liberal friends uh, are, are putting, say, where's the Bill of Rights? Madison, you can hear him sighing because he, he you know, it came up in the last few days of the, uh, of the uh, convention. George Mason 
said, well, we should have a Bill of Rights, and, and you can hear the, most of the members uh, shaking their heads because and, and, they've been meeting for four months. And uh, uh, Mason pushes, and they vote on it, and every delegation turns it down. And Madison had a very you know, intellectual explanation. He said, this is a government of limited powers. A Bill of Rights made sense in England. Of course, the Bill of Rights in England is a fence against the king's power. It's not a fence against Parliament's power. Parliament can do anything it wants. I mean, it can do away with habeas corpus. It can do away with any of the rights of, of Englishmen if it wants to because it's sovereign. But the Bill of Rights in England made sense because the prerogative power was there to be fenced off. Well, Madison tries to explain that. A Bill of Rights of that sort made no sense when you have a government that's got uh, delegated powers, only a limited number of delegated powers. There's no point in putting a Bill of Rights. That might imply that it has more power than, uh, than, than, than it was delegated. Uh, that just doesn't convince uh, uh, Jefferson. And unfortunately, he wrote another letter back to a friend in Maryland saying the same thing, there's no Bill of Rights. Well, that, that guy publishes it. And you can see Madison, oh, no. He's got to deal with this problem now that this Mr. Jefferson from Paris, who is widely respected as being the most cosmopolitan person in all of America, says we have no Bill of Rights. And so the opponents pick that up. And Madison has got a problem, a political problem. And he, uh, well, there's a, I don't know if you want to go into the details of that, but he, uh, he tries to resist that, uh, but he finally uh, concedes. Uh, he, wants, he wants to get into this new government, and Patrick Henry is keeping, trying to ice him out. Patrick Henry controls the Virginia uh, legislature, prevents him from being elected senator, because the legislature in those days elected the senators, and so Madison says, well, I'll run for the House. So what does uh, Henry do? He redistricts this uh, Orange County, uh, trying to get rid of some of the people who might support uh, Madison, particularly Baptists, uh, and uh, puts up against him a young war hero. Madison, of course, never served. A young war hero named James Monroe. And Madison has to campaign in the sense he has to give a speech, uh, electioneering which he hated. He thought that was unbecoming a gentleman. They'd have to even give a speech on his own behalf. And uh, his friends say, look, that's the only way you're going to win. You've got to promise your constituents that you'll support a Bill of Rights. And so he does. He says, if elected, I will uh, support a Bill of Rights. And of course, that's what he does. And he engineers them. But as, as Michael pointed out, the Bill of Rights he comes up with are very different from what the Anti-Federalists wanted. Uh, he looks over the 200 or so amendments that had been suggested, not required by all of the states who, who were involved in ratification. Many of the states ratified, not on condition, but they said, we would like these kinds of amendments. Well, these amendments included things like, let's curb the taxing power, let's do away with the Supreme Court, let's uh, cut the president's power. Very serious, substantial amendments. Well, Madison just throws those all out. And he concentrates on a series of innocuous uh, uh, English legal rights, habeas corpus, trial by jury. Uh, he, the one that he most concerned with, of course, was religious freedom. But nobody complained about that, that Congress should have no power to establish a religion. That, that went without saying. So his Bill of Rights turned out to be, uh, as the Anti-Federalists lamented, a tub for the whale meaning uh, that's a nautical metaphor at the time. Uh, when sailors were beset by a, a whale in their wooden boat, they sometimes got frightened and thought the, the whale might hit the boat. They threw a tub overboard, hoping to divert the whale. Well, that's what the, the, this Bill of Rights was in the eyes of the Anti-Federalists, uh, a tub for the whale. And uh, it worked out that way. The Anti-Federalists were bitter and angry uh, at the results, and the Federalists finally came around and said, this isn't so bad after all, and it, 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 it helped bring North Carolina and Rhode Island into the Union, who had, of course, turned it down in the original. Uh, but that's a long-winded answer to your question. Uh, I, I have two questions already, uh, Nolan and, and George. There he is. All right. Uh, well, I was just saying thank you for being here. This is a great opportunity. Uh, on the topic of the founding, and in particular, thinking about how we teach the founding, um, something that comes up a lot in what you were just sort of describing is 
the influence of conflict uh, at the founding. And one of the things I think about when I teach as a political theorist or as an historian in this period is also sort of conflicting visions of the possibilities and, and what happened. And I can think of at least two alternative frames um, that are not distinct from the one you're providing right now, but are other perspectives. One would be the argument that slavery had an indelible impact on even arguments at the founding. So this would be among political theorists, someone like Roger Smith, Judith Schlar, but also historians like Eric Foner, who point to sort of not just the debates that were going on um, behind doors, but also the influence of slavery of something like Burke's speech uh, on the conciliation of the colonies. Um, and another perspective would be something, as you were just kind of getting it, to insist on the influence of the anti-federalists, right? So as to kind of teach, for example, the Bill of Rights or the Constitution is not a consensus building activity, but something that was always fraught. Um, so I guess my general question is just sort of how as teachers and perhaps also research of this history, should we accommodate these multiple perspectives? Are there um, parts of these perspectives you don't buy as much or, or um, what are your thoughts on this? And thank you. Well, the slavery, of course, is a major uh, interest, especially in the last 30 years or so, or since the 19, the last 40 years, since uh, 50 years since the 1960s when uh, sla slavery became right on our radar screen because of the civil rights movement. And, and historians have tried to argue, and many have argued in books, that slavery was the crucial issue in the convention. I, I don't believe that's so. I think it is an issue, a very important issue, but is not the crucial issue. Uh, so I, there is this famous speech that, or statement that Madison makes uh, during the debate over proportional representation uh, of, the, uh, of, of the two houses in the Congress. He's keen on that. And that is to say he doesn't want the Senate uh, represented by the states, uh, as it turned out. Uh, he wants a popular uh, representation. Uh, the Senate will be smaller, but it's going to be in proportion to, uh, to population. Now, that's not just because he's a Virginian, and Virginia is by far the largest and most populous state, uh, which is what some people have uh, suggested. I, I think that may be true in some, in, to some extent, but Madison has got, uh, an, another, he's got another fear. He fears that if the Senate, as it ended up, uh, elected by the state legislatures and with equality uh, for each uh, state, uh, as we now have, uh, that this, this state power, and he fears the states, uh, because he says, of course, people's loyalties are initially to their state, uh, that this will vitiate the Constitution and ultimately destroy it. Uh, and therefore, he wants to keep the states out of this thing entirely. And that's why he fights so strongly. And when he's defeated with the famous Connecticut Compromise, uh, that's not a compromise for him. That's a defeat. He sees that as a real loss, and he, he uh, uh, gets together with his uh, caucuses with his colleagues, uh, the nationalists, including his Virginia delegation, to talk about walking out. Now, if Virginia had walked out, that's the end. You have to keep in mind, Virginia dominated the country in a way no state ever has since. Uh, it was by far the largest state in territory, in population, in wealth. Uh, it's not surprising that four out of the five, first five presidents are Virginians and that the commander-in-chief is a Virginian. Virginia dominated the country. And if it walked out, that's the... And, it, of course, there was a Virginia plan that was the working model for the Constitution. So if Virginia walks out, that's the end of this convention. So uh, he, the, he and his colleagues reluctantly stay in, and they get the Connecticut Compromise. Now, during that debate, he's trying to get... Because the small states are fighting furiously. They do not want to give up... Uh, uh, representation uh, by them as a state to, uh, to these populous states. They feel they'll just be overwhelmed. And so they fight hard, and that's the issue, small state versus large state. Well, Madison comes in with a statement, he says, you know, the real issue here is between the slave states and the non-slave states. Uh, that's a, that's, that's, I don't think he really believes that. I think he's you, trying to get people off of this small state, big state, and get them into thinking differently. Uh, I don't really think that's a major issue. There's no doubt that if they'd taken any strong stand, as Gouverneur Morris in his uh, cynical ploys threw out, let's you know, do away with slavery, that Georgia and South Carolina at least would have walked out, and that would have been, uh, would have been a serious problem. So uh, slavery is there. 
but they're embarrassed by it. They don't mention it, but it's there in, in, in indirect form, as you know. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that I think all of these people believe that slavery was dying. Now, they couldn't have been more wrong. But I, I can give you quotation after quotation that shows that they thought slavery was going to eventually disappear. Um, now, maybe the southern planter in South Carolina who's ordering more slaves or uh, the ones who are moving into the Mississippi area knew better, but these leaders live with the illusion, and they did for a whole generation until the Missouri Compromise, I think, as an eye-opening experience, uh, that, that slavery was, was going to die. And so that gives them some confidence in the future. That's why they don't mention, they don't want to taint the Constitution with the word slave or slavery. Uh, there's an assumption that it will eventually disappear. And that at this point, what's the point of breaking the Union up and this dream of this United States uh, for something, that, an institution that is going to eventually disappear of its own uh, natural forces? Now, as I say, they couldn't be more wrong. They live with illusions. Of course, we live with illusions, too. Uh, we just don't know what they are. Uh, some historian, uh, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, will look back and say, how could they have believed that? Uh, and that's what, what happened. People realized later, well, after 1819 especially, uh, that slavery was not going to go away and that it was going to eventually probably tear the Union apart, which, of course, it did. I don't know if that answered your question. What was it? There was another part to the. Yeah, okay. Short intervention here. It's on? Okay, yeah. good. I just wanted to mention, I think it was last year, uh, Michael Zuckert from Notre Dame spoke here uh, about slavery as it was discussed uh, at the convention and made this. Uh, it was, I was happy to learn this, Ast astonishing, astounding point. In 1790, before the cotton gin, the United States exported 4,000 bales of cotton. 4,000. In 1860, uh, just before the war, the uh, United States exported 4 million bales of cotton the value of which was more than all other American exports combined. Right. Staggering. Yeah, no, that obviously, well, it, the, the, the cotton gin would have been invented. You can't blame poor Whitney for that. Uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to come up with it because it was a, it, it, the demand for cotton was so great. And they, the, the, I'm not sure, I don't know the technicalities of this, but uh, sooner or later, somebody was going to, some smart engineering type guy was going to come up with some solution to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the problem of, of dealing. Otherwise, doing, doing it by hand was so slow that you measured it by ounces. I mean, and once you got that kind of mechanized, uh, and of course, Americans were famous for this right through the whole period. Uh, of, there were more patents taken out in America in this period from, say, 1790 to 1830 than per capita than any other country in the world, including England. So Americans were very inventive, and they, they, usually their inventions were not by uh, people as, uh, as educated as Whitney. I think he was a Yale graduate, but by ordinary workmen who just were sharp and had a problem, and they solved it in some way by labor, some labor-saving device. So that would have been, it, that was in the cards sooner or later to come up with that. So we can't just blame Whitney. Uh, but there's no doubt that cotton became, uh, became king in, in the South and, and reinforced uh, slavery. Virginia, of course, is, is not cotton growing. You can't grow cotton in Virginia. Uh, well, you, you're, you're Virginia? No, you're North Carolina. Well, North Carolina's not so good either. But Virginia, this great big state with all these slaves, and they have about 40% of their population is enslaved, didn't grow cotton. And, and they had nothing to export. Tobacco is, is a so, so, uh, soil exhausting uh, product. Uh, what they were exporting uh, through this whole period, uh, from say 1790 to the right up to the Civil War, were slaves. They're selling slaves to Mississippi and Alabama in the Deep South. That's their major export. Uh, it's an interesting fact, uh, and I'm not a Civil War historian, but you may have some here that uh, you know the Confederation 
the, the, the Southern Confederation goes, the, the, the Southern states go out in two, 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 two times. The, the Confederation is, is formed with the lower South, the upper South, including Virginia, is not in it. And, and uh, the, the lower South uh, Confederation, Constitution is drawn up, it prohibits the importation of, uh, of, uh, of slaves. No international slave trade to be tolerated. Well, Virginia's outside. Virginia's is they, they wanted Virginia in the in the uh, in the Confederation because it even though it wasn't as powerful as it was in 1790, it's still uh, somehow the, the great state. And they uh, but they write this prohibition on the international slave trade, which meant that Virginia had no market for its slaves. Uh, I don't think that was the inducement. That's not the reason why Virginia joined, finally joined the Confederation, but it certainly is an interesting, uh, interesting fact. Uh, but it does point out the importance of slave exportation, e exports for, for Virginia. George? Thank you. I've got hopefully two quick questions that come out of the remarks you've already made. The first one is, in, in retrospect, obviously Madison seems so dominant and influential to us and, and was, um, going into the convention, it seems to me it's not obvious that he would be, right? He's not particularly old. There are certainly other people of, of significant standing and stature there. What was it about Madison that allowed him to become so influential in the convention and then also in the uh, creation of the, the Bill of Rights? Um, and the second question is sort of a, a, I guess, slightly more technical one. You, you mentioned the kind of not unanimous, but widespread agreement that you need taxing power at, at, at the, um, the level of the, of the, the Continental Congress. Um, at the same time, when we get to the Anti-Federalist Papers, there's a whole lot of opposition to the idea that you know, right, the federal government can act on individuals and tax individuals directly, and instead an argument for continuing to rely on requisitions from the state legislature. So I'm wondering, so where, you know, where does this concern about the administration of the taxing power come from? And then also, what did the anti-federalists think was the alternative? If, if, if you agree that the requisition system doesn't work, then what did they propose instead? All right, well, the first on, on Madison. I mean, Madison is just one of those guys who does his homework, who reads, gets his act together before he talks. He's well prepared. He, as a congressman, they were awed by him. He just, they're trying to discuss the first tariff. He's the only one that's collected all the information, what the tariffs are being charged by each state. He's that kind of guy. He comes well informed, and people are just overwhelmed by that. Uh, he's uh, not a great speaker, but he is uh, lucid and uh, on the point, and he prepares. He, he deserves the title of father of the Constitution, even though a few historians have pointed out that his major two points, he loses. So, uh, and he sees it as a failure. He writes to Jefferson and says, this thing's not going to work. Because he, he wants that negative. It gives you an idea of how much he feared the states, uh, that he wants a negative. And he feels that that's the heart and soul, absolutely necessary. That's his term. Without it, the thing won't work. So think about that. that. That gives you an idea of how much he feared what the states were doing. Uh, now, they weren't doing much that we would be alarmed by. But for him, it was not what he, democracy is supposed to be. So he comes prepared. He writes. He write when he's preparing himself for this convention. He writes this essay, which I think called "The Vices of the Political System of the United States." You can call it up in your iPad. It's about six or eight pages long. He outlines what's wrong with the country that would justify what he wants to do, and some of those uh, points he makes there show up later in the Federalist Papers. It's an unpublished paper. It's a working paper. He doesn't show it to people. He just wants to get his ideas straight. And he outlines three basic problems this, for the state legislatures there. Mutability of the legislation, meaning it's changing all the time. The multiplicity of legislation. He says more acts have been passed since the Declaration of Independence by the state legislatures than were passed by all the colonial legislatures in the entire colonial history. So he says, and then finally, the injustice. Now you have to understand, the states are given an enormous, state legislature given an enormous power by these co state constitutions, which are far more important than we give credit for. We always focus on the federal government, which is derivative of the state constitutional experience of 1776. 
you want to know where separation of powers comes from? Uh, the uh, three part tripartite government, executive, legislative, and and uh, 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 judicial. That comes out of the state constitution making. Now, what they did was take away all of the prerogative powers of the governors. They have no veto power. They their appointment appointing power is severely limited. Uh, even the pardoning power, which seems inherently magisterial or executive, is taken away and given to the state legislatures. So these legislatures have this enormous power, and they begin abusing it immediately. And that's what he's concerned about. Uh, and then he has, a, of course, an experience in the state legislature uh, in Virginia for, for three years. He's, he likes being at the Congress, but the, he's got, they got term limits. It's built into the articles. So he has to leave after three years, and so he has no career. You know, he's uh, living with, with his father uh, on his plantation, living off of his father. Uh, and uh, he, so he goes and runs for the state legislature and serves for three years, which is an eye-opening experience for him because uh, he finds what clods these people are <laughs> the, that he's got to deal with. They don't have any sense. They've never been to college. They haven't, you know, they haven't been to Princeton. They haven't even been to... William and Mary, and so he, he feels uh, this is the kind of person that's going to be running our government, and they're looking to misbehaving in unjust laws, particularly he's very concerned about minority rights. Now, his minority isn't one that we feel a lot of sympathy for. They're creditors, but that's what he feels. Creditors had a different meaning for them, for these gentry, than, than it would for us, since that's a major source of their, uh, of their uh, money. They, unlike the English gentry who lived off of rents from tenants. Uh, the English aristocracy's money came to it without exertion. The rents, uh, tenantry doesn't work well in, the, in America because the land is too plentiful. So the major means by which a, a wealthy person would, would live with his money invested is in, uh, in money out on loan, uh, lending money out. And that interest is what you live off of. In the, in, it's a counterpart, so to speak, to the rents that the English aristocracy were receiving. Well, you know, uh, uh, creditors are hurt badly by inflation, and paper money, uh, the paper money was was devastating uh, to to it inflated the, the currency, and so creditors are getting paid back uh, with a piece of paper that's a fraction of what they had actually lent out. Sometimes lent out in silver or gold. So he's concerned about that, and that, those are the three things he isolates. Uh, isolates uh, mutability. I mean, these legislatures, for the first time, are and, outside of New England, are annually elected. The turnover rate, one study's been done of Virginia, is 60%. Every year, you get 60% new, new, new people in the legislature. And of course, they all have interests to promote or, uh, with new ideas. That's where you're getting the mutability. Every legislature's passing a whole bunch of new laws. This is what he's experiencing. He's seeing it and experiencing it. Others are too, otherwise he could never have, have the support he had. That's what he wants to deal with. That's what he's focusing on. That's the Constitution is a solution to that in his mind. Not just the problems of the Confederation, which could have been dealt with by adding a couple of amendments. Now, you say the, the, um, the taxing power they were going to add was a tariff, maybe 5% on goods uh, uh, imported into the country. That, uh, that would not have been, it wouldn't have touched people directly. And of course, later American experience shows that. Uh, the Jeffersonians do away with all kinds of taxes except for taxes on uh, imports. And that, and as Jefferson said in one of his uh, speeches, that touches only the wealthy people, uh, the 1%, the if you will. And so it's not even a burden. So, but what, what the Anti-Federalists are opposed to is the fear that taxing is going to be directly at the individual which is the point you raised. And it's, as the phrasing goes in the Constitution, it could, it could be a direct tax. Uh, and, and that's just one of the things they object to. The whole idea of this government, uh, a distant government, imposing itself directly on individuals is just so, so unanticipated, so unprecedented. They had just thrown off that kind of government. And all theory, those who had any reading, realized that Montesquieu said no republic can exist over a large extended territory. Too many different interests, they'll all, they need a home, Montesquieu said you need a small homogeneous population to sustain a republic. Here's this large republic being proposed 
it's amazing that there wasn't more opposition. What needs explaining is how, how did they, how did Madison get enough people to support the, this idea of a large, large government? Let's, let's go here first and then to Alex. No, you go ahead. Hello? Yes. Yeah. So um, as opposed to Montesquieu, Voltaire said, if you have one religion in a state, you get tyranny. If you have two, you get civil war. If you have 30, you get tolerance. All right. So well, that's, that's a great the basis of the extended No, no, that, that's exactly, if you want to understand Madison's uh, 51, Federalist 51, it comes from his personal experience shepherding uh, the one accomplishment he had in the legislature during his three-year, which was a trial and tribulation for him, uh, was, was shepherding Jefferson's bill for religious freedom through the House, through the legislature. And he comes to this uh, in a way out of experience. He, he says um, he believed in religious liberty, not, not toleration. He says we're going to move, he says to Jefferson, we're going to move beyond Locke. Locke stopped the toleration. We're going to have real religious freedom. And he concludes, Jefferson lives in a kind of rational dream world. Jefferson thinks the population will eventually become uh, so knowledgeable and so aware of the world the way he did it that they will come to believe in separation of church and state. And Madison knows better. He says, that's not the way it's going to work. He says, we're going to get separation of church and state because we have so many sects or denominations. Jefferson went to William & Mary. <laughs> uh, that's Princeton. right. And uh, so he, he concludes that uh, if the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Methodists are all competing with one another, uh, they are the ones opposed to the Anglican establishment. You know, if the Pres Presbyterians could have been assured that they would be in control of the state, they would never have accepted separation. They don't come to it out of rational uh, enlightenment thinking. They come to it out of necessity. In other words, they conclude, and Madison, this is Madison's insight. He, he realizes that these people are accepting separation of church and state because they fear one another. They don't want their competitor to gain control of the state apparatus. So the, the separation of church and state comes from the, the realization that since my denomination can't control the apparatus of the state, better to neutralize it for all of us. Yeah. That's the source of separation of church and state. Madison reaches that conclusion. Jefferson never understands it. Madison tries to explain it to him. Jefferson still lives in a intellectual world where he thinks people are becoming rational and will accept it for that reason. And of course, it's coming from a very different direction. So Madison applies that insight to the, to the whole country of all interest groups. That's where the factions are going to fight with each other. The enlarged sphere of government, and he, of course, he borrows this, this insight too from Hume, who said, Montesquieu's wrong. Hume, of course, was very provocative, always trying to look at things from another angle. A uh, very bright guy uh, for that reason. And he, 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 Madison picks that up and he thinks it through and he says that's exactly how it's going to work. We're going to expand the, uh, the uh, sphere of government. You see, the problem that he realizes, and of course Je he tries to tell Jefferson about it, you may well wonder, he says, of course Jefferson didn't, wasn't capable of thinking like this, he says, you may well wonder why will this federal government not end up abusing power the same way the states have done. In other words, why can't they have excesses of democracy at the federal level? And he says, this is where his hope comes from. This expanded sphere of government will create this, uh, these, this competition among the factions. Now, he's not an interest group theorist, like David Truman or something, a political scientist. He's, uh, he really believes these people will paralyze each other the way the, the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Baptists did. And this will allow an enlightened elite, like himself and Jefferson, to promote a public good. That's his vision. It's not interest group politics of a modern sort, but I think he does have that. But it's an extraordinary insight, and that's what gives him. And he has an auxiliary disoratum in the last sentence of his vice's essay. He says, besides, we're going to extract from the society the noblest, finest characters who are going to end up in the government. Uh, now, it works this way. He thinks. If you take the state of North Carolina, this one, this had 232 members in the state legislature. It's 232. The Congress, the first federal Congress is going to have 65 members, five of whom will be from, from North Carolina. 
The idea is, and this costs 65 for 4 million people, is smaller than any of the state legislatures. I mean, Massachusetts had a legislature of 350 people. So you start with 65, right away you're narrowing the representation. This, of course, was a major problem for the Anti-Federalists. You're going to, only the elite are going to get in, aristocrats will get in, and so on. And of course, that's exactly what Madison's hope is. He says, uh, he says, he thinks about, say, North Carolina. There are only five congressmen, but there are only five college graduates in the whole state. And he assumes that those five co college graduates will be the one who will go, ones who will go into the Congress, and therefore you have a, a, a more enlightened, uh, cosmopolitan elite. He has code words running right through the Federalist Papers. The people he doesn't like are narrow-minded, parochial, illiberal, meaning in, in uh, 18th century terms, liberal meaning like liberal arts, the opposite. Uh, and, and, and those are the anti-Federalists in his mind, the, the William Finleys. William Finley is this legislator from uh, Western Pennsylvania who's an ex-weaver, uh, never went to college, smart guy, however. And uh, the interesting point that helps explain why the convention was able to get away with meeting. Finley is from Pennsylvania, and the legislature, uh, he's one of the promoters of paper money and all of the things that Madison dislikes. He's narrow-minded, parochial, and so on. Uh, they ask him, Mr. Finley, would you like to go to this meeting in Philadelphia? And he said, will you pay my way? And they say, no. He said, well, I can't afford that. And so as a consequence, the delegation from Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia Convention are all citizens of Philadelphia. In fact, one of them, Governor Morris, is a New Yorker. He happens to own some property in Philadelphia, and his, uh, his friend, Robert Morris, who's no relation, says, Governor, why don't you come along to this meeting? You're a handyman with a pen, and you're smart. We could use you. So you have a, you have a loaded delegation from Pennsylvania. Uh, and Finley, he doesn't think that this thing is going to do what it did. He thinks it's just going to add a couple of, it's going to be a meeting and kind of just going to add a couple of amendments, which he's in favor of. Well, he's stunned when the thing comes up. This isn't what he asked for. This isn't what he thought. And the antifellas are thrown back on their heels. They just, how do you, and, and it's very difficult for them because the confederation, in effect, has collapsed. And, and you can't even get a quorum any minute from Congress. So, as Richard Henry Lee said, it's very shrewd politics. He says, he was one of the opponents from Virginia, and he is an aristocrat. He says, look, it's this or nothing. And of course, in the end, um, many of the anti fellows don't want nothing. Melanchthon Smith, a really tough-minded uh, anti fellows from New York, brilliant man, uneducated, gives uh, Livingston and Hamilton a real run for their, for, for, for their money in the debates over representation, over aristocracy. Uh, and uh, in the end, however, Smith votes for the Constitution because you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to have chaos. He doesn't want anarchy. He doesn't want to have the United States end. So um, it became very difficult for the opponents, I think. You know, I should, we should say something about those documents uh, because you're, some of you are interested in political theory. As you may know, uh, the Historical Society of Wisconsin has been collecting everything, that they, every scrap of evidence over the ratification debates. And these are one of the great debates of the basic issues of politics, representation, aristocracy, power, liberty, rights, everything you can think of. And it, it's resulting in about 25 volumes at this point, with I think two or three more to come. Now, look, the debates in fifth century Athens may have been richer, but we don't know, do we? We don't have them. And the debates in 17th century England may have been uh, better. Who knows? We have a fragment of what went on. But here we have it, 27 volumes of, of these debates from high-level, most intelligent, intellectual people in the society down to the common man. And they're all there to be, and they're going to be online, I think, soon, right? It's just an extraordinary resource when you think about it. And so there's nothing like it in the history of the Western world, as far as I know. I mean, just think of it. 27 volumes over four months or six months from September through June, nine, ten months of debates. Uh, not just the debates, but the newspaper articles, too. Everything they can get together. These, uh, John Kaminsky now is heading it. Um, they're getting together, and they're almost done. 
it's just an incredible resource for us, you know? I, I think you had them going until you got to the 27 number. Uh, is it 27? No, no, it is 27, this, which is a, and they're big. Books, I know, yeah. Too, no, yes. it's <laughs> In any case, uh, Alex? I never got to ask my question. Sure, oh, okay, okay. sorry. What was it? <laughs> which was, um, what was it? Um, I, what, something you said, and actually when you talked about the ancient Greeks, it raised it again, uh, made me think of mixed government and Aristotle and John Witherspoon, and uh, who was Madison's teacher at, at the College of New Jersey and the teacher of a lot of the other people at the convention too. Um, so I think, I think the Scottish, the Greek, through the Scottish interpretation of the Greeks, played a big role in um, what happened at the convention, and certainly in Madison's thought in the extended republic. So I'm wondering if you would talk about Witherspoon and uh, mixed government and those issues there. Well, as a historian, I find it very difficult to pinpoint uh, influences in that way. Uh, I, I mean, I to use a contemporary example. A lot of people believe that poverty causes crime. Somebody says, poverty causes crime. Where did he get that idea? Oh, did he re read Karl Marx? No, he probably didn't read Karl Marx, but somehow he concludes that Poverty causes crime. Now, some historian studying this guy later comes across this and says, well, he must have read Karl Marx because Karl Marx said that. That's the problem. I mean, that's a crude way. Of, that's a problem of influence. It's very, very difficult. I mean, mixed government, insofar as people understood it, was a very confused, was certainly not the product of some teacher in, in, at Princeton. It, 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 you know, John Adams believed in it, especially John Adams. But it was part of a, an educated person's uh, equipment. If they thought about government, they, of course, the English Constitution was the ideal mixed government. Now, it's a, there's nothing more conf difficult to get across to my colleagues and students is this problem of mixed government. Because they get all, mi they get all mixed up with the idea that, well, you have a Senate, and you have a House, and you have a, uh, you have a, a governor or, or a president. And they think in terms of the institutions of government, when in fact mixed government is a mixture of social estates, social bodies, uh, as Adams called it. Now, not everybody grasped that, including present-day scholars, but not everybody at the time either. But they certainly had a sense, of, Adams certainly does. When he proposes in his thoughts on government, we should have a three-part government, uh, meaning a house, a senate, and a governor, he's thinking in terms of estates. The House will represent the people. The Senate will represent the wise people of the community, a kind of aristocracy, but it's not hereditary. The Senate, even though it may be elected, does not represent anything. The House of Representatives is the representative body at first. Now, this all changes. Uh, and the governor stands for what you might call the monarchical element in the mixed government, although they don't use that term explicitly. Adams has the habit of doing that, which gets him in no end of trouble. He never loses that sense that estates are being, rec are being uh, embodied in the government, which causes him endless trouble. Now, the way that changes, and this, I think, goes, if you're interested in political theory in America, you've got to deal with the way the ideas change under dynamic conditions. Now, let me give you a concrete example of that, what I'm talking about. It, it, Pennsylvania is, is, is the most radical constitution. Those people want no aristocracy, no monarchy, so they have a single house legislature, unicameral legislature, which is going to represent only the people. Now, that is a bitterly opposed by conservatives who want an upper house. Uh, in addition, they want a governor, but they focus on the upper house first. By 1778, they're proposing we should, Pennsylvania is different from all the other states. We look awkward, we're foolish. The, uh, the Constitution is ridiculed by elites everywhere. We've got to have an upper house. A and uh, the uh, supporters of the Constitution, this radical Constitution, say, what are you trying to do? Foist the House of Lords on us? And the uh, proponents of the reform, who want bicameral, say, no, no, we don't want a House, uh, a house of Lords. We don't want an aristocracy. All we want is a double representation of the people. Now, think about what that means. Now, that's thrown out in a, a kind of instrumental way. They, they don't think through the implications of what they say. They just want an argument that will get them off the hook that they're supporting an aristocracy. 
They can't afford to say, yeah, yeah, we want an aristocracy. That just wouldn't work anymore. The, the population's becoming more egalitarian. So they say a double representation of the people. Well, that's a, that's a strange way to justify it because if the people can be represented twice, why not three times, why not four times? And that's exactly what happens over the next decade. People pick that up. And by the time you get to the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, they're beginning to argue that the governor is the representative of the people. Now, and by the time you get to the federal constitution, the Federalists grab a hold of that idea and run with it. Everything is representative of the people. Representation suddenly spreads everywhere. Now, we're stuck with this awkward reminder of all these houses of representatives in our states that at one point, there was just one body that represented the people. But now, of course, people don't think in those terms. And the Supreme Court finally woke up with the proportional decisions in the 1960s uh, and said, well, those Senates in the states ought to be representative, more representative. And so they, they, Baker versus Carr and a whole series of decisions may force the states to make their Senates uh, more representative. Uh, the, the court just didn't realize what the origins were. Talk about originalism. Uh, they couldn't have done it anyhow because it would be too absurd to think of the our, our Senate as being little aristocracies. Uh, but that's how ideas change in a, in a dynamic democratic society. Let me give you one other example how things can get out of hand. You, you've all read Federalist 78, Hamilton's argument for judicial review. One of his arguments is he says more or less to the state legislatures, especially uh, he's speaking to New Yorkers, you, you state legislators, you think you're the people? No, you're not the people. You're not the, the people exist outside. In fact, the judges are equally agents of the people, he says. Think of that. He says, the judges are equally agents of the people. That's an argument he needs to make to justify what he, the judicial review. Well, within a couple of years, by 1805, in fact, that's the first example I've seen, and there may be earlier ones, someone says, you know, if the judges are agents of the people, maybe we ought to elect them. And sure enough, there's a proposal that runs right through the Jacksonian period, right up to the present. We half the, at least half the states elect their judges. Under the, you know, the strangest kind of thing, ideas are are, are, are are forced to change under these kinds of pressures. I think that's the most important way of, of approaching intellectual history. Now that differs from from, uh, say, studying the influence of Rousseau on such and such, or the influence of uh, Voltaire or uh, Burke or something on some. Uh, but I think that's a better way of studying uh, ideas and the changing nature of ideas in a dynamic democratic society than uh, looking at closet philosophies. Uh, but I'm sure that challenges the views of many of, uh, of you who are uh, political theorists. I have a question about Rousseau's influence on the fan. Um, but more specifically, I think I have a question about the relation between theory and practice in the American founding. Because the same century, Rousseau is thinking about how an, a, a people makes its way to Republican self-government. And he thinks that somewhere along the line, after a lot has been put in place, this mysterious extra legal figure, this person that doesn't really have the authorization from any corner to do anything like forming a people into a people, let's call him Madison, but Rousseau calls him the legislator, <coughs> comes in and, and just changes things up, puts the people in a position to bear a particular set of laws and shapes them into people that then continue without the legislator to be a republic and to function as a republic. And so I am curious if Madison is playing the role of Rousseau's legislator, whether what you're interpreting to have happened here is the Americans were very, very lucky that even though Madison was much more involved with the political system after the legislation, that no tyranny occurred. I mean, in theory, we get very uncomfortable when Rousseau talks about a legislator. It seems in practice, nothing uncomfortable really happened. And I'm wondering why. Did Madison have something, was there a secret to the American founding where this hijack happened that allowed the aftermath to really be self-governing oh, no, those, those are good questions. I mean, first of all, uh, the crucial decision is, is 1776, to become independent and become republics, 13 independent republics. So the Republican decision is made then 
and it's, it's a, each of the states is an independent republic. And so that's, uh, that you want to keep in mind. So the, the so-called legislator, Madison is not in control. He, is, he, he could never have done what he did without a lot of support. He's sh those views are shared by uh, a host of elites for the most part. It is a loaded convention. You know, there are very, I mean, Yates and, and Lansing from New York uh, are there, and, and they are real, true anti-federalists. Uh, but as soon as, and, and along with their colleague uh, Alexander Hamilton, but as soon as they see and can grasp the implications of this Virginia plan, they're, they're out of here. We're out of here. And they leave. And, and as a consequence, New York never has a vote through the rest of the convention. Uh, it, it, it's just simply, not, Hamilton can make speeches, but he cannot vote because there's no quorum. Uh, so Madison, he loses crucial battles, but I would not call him the legislator. If you want to know why the American thing ex succeeded, one of the reasons was, as I explained, that it, it gets to the point where th there's this or nothing, and many of the anti-federalists, like Melanchthon Smith, do not want chaos. They don't want anarchy. Uh, and so they do support it. But the other thing we have to keep in mind is that these are Englishmen, by and large. They've got 100 years or more of self-government. Compared to the French. The French haven't had an Estates General meeting since 1614 or something. They've been meeting and they've been, now it's not democracy by modern standards, but it's, it's the most democratic polities in the world at the time. Two out of three adult white males could vote uh, through the colonial period. Now that's extraordinary. One out of six adult males in England could vote, even though England's regarded as the great democracy, if you will, of the 18th century. With good reason. I mean, there, there's nothing like the House of Commons anywhere in the, in the world. Uh, so these, and, and they've had trial by jury. They've had habeas corpus. They've had all these English rights. It's in their blood. It's in their experience. So they're not going to go down the path that the French did. Uh, for that reason, if you want a short answer to that, why did it succeed? They were used to debating. They were used to um, arguments. They were used to having legislatures and and voting and all of that, that makes a, I mean, we can see what's happening in the Middle East to realize how, how important that kind of experience is. And that, I think, in the end, makes all the difference. Uh, there's no single legislator. Now, Madison is very crucial because he is the kind of nerd that is taking notes and working things out. But he certainly consulted with the Virginia delegation. Uh, he consults with Washington. He consults with Randolph and the others. Uh, he's got his Virginia people with him. And then he's, he's obviously gets along with some of the others. Uh, Mil Wilson, who is by far the most underrated intellectual figure in the whole founding. He, he ends up rather badly in the end of his life because as he said, he ends up fleeing from, from creditors. Uh, but brilliant man, and he comes up with so much, uh, so many interesting ideas. He's, he's kind of the the first the Philadelphia lawyer. He's very clever, and so he has all kinds of odd, odd ideas. But he's, he's certainly worth, and there's no really good book on him, uh, on Wilson. He tends to, everyone focuses on Madison. When in fact, some of the best arguments made at the convention and outside in the ratifying debates are made by Wilson. He's the one that comes up with the notion uh, of, of solving the problem of sovereignty. I don't know if it's worth discussing, but uh, sovereignty was the issue over which the empire broke. Sovereignty is the major doctrine in the Anglo-American world of the 18th century. It's the idea uh, classically expressed by Blackstone, not invented by him, but that there must be in every state one final, indivisible, supreme power, or you have an imperium in imperium, an imperio in imperium, a power within a power. So it, it, it's not only the fact that, that the parliament has the king, the lords, and the people embodied in it that gives it, it's the whole society speaking, but that there must be in every state some final power, the logic of it. There has to be this one final power. That's what they keep throwing to the faces of their colonists in the debate in 1760s. See, the Americans are trying to explain, look, we, we're willing to let Parliament regulate our trade. It's done the Molasses Act, the Navigation Acts since the 17th century. We've accepted those. But we're not going to accept taxation. We're not going to accept the Tamp Stamp Act. They keep trying to draw distinctions, trying to explain their experience in the empire. 
And they do that for almost five years or so. And then finally, the, the, the British come back with this idea of sovereignty. Look, if you agree to, in one instant, in the Molasses Act or the Navigation Act, that Parliament has authority over you, then you have to accept Parliament's total authority. It's an all or nothing thing. And they, they throw it out in a kind of naive way because they, these English Whigs are so devoted to Parliament. Again, that's an important point. We don't appreciate how much Parliament was respected by liberals, by libertarians in the 18th century. Parliament is the bulwark of an Englishman's liberty. It wrote the Bill of Rights. It protects the people from the Crown's encroaching, usurping power. So Parliament is the best defense of the people's liberty. So they can't understand the Americans' uh, aversion to it. Why don't, what's, what, why, you're crazy if you want to be outside of Parliament. So, but the, the, so the, the British uh, pamphleteers say, look, either take Parliament uh, totally or take, don't take it. You can't have ha it, uh, a bit of it. They think, thinking that by giving them this awesome choice that they, of course they would not want to be outside of Parliament's authority. Well, exactly, that's exactly what the Americans choose. And there are a number of moments that this happens. The classic one is when Governor Hutchinson, in his naivete, in January of 1773, gives a speech to the, to the general court of Massachusetts saying the same thing. He repeats more or less what the pamphleteers are saying. If you, if you don't accept Parliament's authority in, 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 at all, then you're going to be considered independent outside of Parliament. And he thinks that that's such a awful thing to do, I mean, to, to be outside of Parliament. And of course, the House response is, well, if you give us the choice of either we're totally under Parliament's authority or we're independent, well, then we're going to choose to be independent. However, we'll tie ourselves to the Crown. I mean, not all that different from what, uh, 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 what's his name in Scotland, uh, where Salman was, was proposing uh, uh, just, just over the last few months. Uh, and that's the American position. By 1774, every major intellectual is saying, we are tied uh, only to the king. And we're outside of Parliament's authority entirely. Now, it's a little awkward. They ha how do you handle the, the, the uh, uh, regulation of trade? Well, the Continental Congress says it's a very awkward statement they have to make. Well, we'll let you do it out of the exigency or the necessity of the case. But you don't have any authority to regulate our trade because we don't accept Parliament's authority. It's a very awkward way of handling it. Wilson, as I say, a very shrewd lawyer, he tries to come up with a notion. He throws out the idea, why don't we consider uh, trade regulation one of the prerogative powers of the king? Well, that's, that's too much to sell. But it, it, only a Philadelphia lawyer can come up with that uh, solution. <laughs> but that's the position. Now, think about that sovereignty issue. It doesn't come up in the debates over the Confederation because each of the states consider themselves sovereign. It comes up again in the debate over the Constitution, the Anti-Federalists grab a hold of it and said, according to the doctrine of sovereignty, there must be in every state one final supreme uh, uh, power. Uh, and, uh, and, and then because of the Supremacy Clause, that's going to be Congress. The states were, left, were going to be left measuring the height of fence posts and laying out roads, and that's all we're going to have to do. And that's the terrifying position they offer, which, they call, which is called consolidation. We're going to have a consolidated government. Many people would say that's, that's exactly what they got. We got 200 some years later. But they, they raised this problem of sovereignty. And at first, the Federalists tried to do what they had, the colonists had done. No, no, we're going to have divided sovereignty. We're going to have you, you know, states do some things, federal government does other things. Sovereignty is going to be divided. And the anti Federalists, just like the British, throw it back in their faces and say, no, it's indivisible. It's, there has to be one, one supreme final power. And, and the Federalists don't know what to do with that argument until Wilson comes up with a solution in a, in a speech in the convention, ratifying convention and out of doors in Philadelphia. And he says, we're not going to deny sovereignty. We fully accept it. We're going to put it in the people. Well, he's not saying, I mean, it's really a brilliant solution. He's giving legal authority to the people. Uh, and once Madison grasps, he says, oh, my God. With this idea, we can everything solved. So suddenly, sovereignty exists in the people, and they dole out little bits and pieces of their power to various agents. 
some governors, senators, federal uh, president, you know, and so on. All of these officials become agents with uh, pieces of the people's power who retain final sovereignty. It's an extraordinary, I mean, how meaningful it is. Legally, he's not saying that all power is derived from the people. I mean, all Whigs believe that, English Whigs as well. Uh, but he's saying it's an active sovereign power. A and it's a brilliant solution because the Anatolians can't handle it. And it solves so many problems. You see it come out, and Madison runs with it. I mean, he sees it uh, immediately as that, that uh, this is a solution to all our problems. And he uses it in the Federalist Papers. That's the way ideas uh, develop uh, under, I think, in a, in a, certainly in a democratic polity, under dynamic conditions, you're forced to come up with arguments. It's an instrumentalist view of, of ideas. Uh, they, they, they don't come up with them because they read Locke the night before. I mean, they might go consulting some of their books to see what kind of arguments they could devise. They're lawyers for the most part, and they try to build case like they would do in a courtroom for their client. They may be dissembling, uh, disingenuous. Now, there's a new book coming out, and some of you may know about it. Eric uh, uh, Nelson is, teaches political theory at Harvard. He's got a book called The Royalist Revolution. I was telling Michael about it. Uh, I'm reviewing it for the New Republic. It's a, you know, it's a very clever book. I think too clever by half, as we say. But uh, you'll, you'll, he's dealing with all these issues. And of course, he, he's got a, an interesting argument that I think uh, you'll have to those of you who teach or write about American political theory in the founding will have to deal with because he, he, he really, he's a very provocative guy. But he's also smart, so it's a, it's a tricky, uh, it's going to be a tricky book. Yeah, you dropped the name of uh, Wilson, and uh, it struck me that uh, that uh, suggests uh, the gap in Madison's notes uh, in late July and early August of 1787, uh, while the Committee of Detail was drafting uh, elements of the, of the Constitution. And uh, I wonder if uh, uh, too much notice is given to Madison's notes as distinguished from what was going on on the committee where they were writing drafts. I mean, uh, Randolph, uh, uh, wrote the section on the uh, federal jurisdiction for the, yeah. for the U.S. courts. And uh, uh, Rutledge was there to defend the interests of the, of the cotton states. Right. And uh, you, have, uh, you have Ellsworth of, of Connecticut, uh, who was somehow linked to the cotton states uh, in, their, uh, in their alliance. And uh, then you have Wilson. Uh, and Wilson, uh, Wilson writes, I think he writes the report, but Rutledge presents it uh, to the convention. So what are we to make of, the, of, this, of this drafting committee as distinguished from Madison's notes, which uh, Krosky thought uh, he may have massaged uh, prior to their prior to his death and their later publication. Well, <coughs> you, you obviously know more about this uh, that, than I do. Uh, I mean, I, I, the committee of detail, I mean, the committee who drew up the Constitution is very important, and, and Wilson was on it. Madison was not. Uh, but they were talking with each other. I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to your question, uh, but they obviously talked to one another. Wilson and Madison did talk to one another. Uh, what's surprising is that Hamilton uh, didn't ask him to be one of the writers for the Federalist Papers, but uh, Wilson May was in Philadelphia in this, in they, and Madison was in New York, and that, that's what happened. Uh, Hamilton organized that. But uh, Wilson is, I, I just don't know the answer to your question of what went on in that committee of, of, of detail. Um, they worked, up, you know, they, they signed, Gouverneur Morris was terribly important in writing it up. I think uh, he, he regarded things as a kind of a lock that should have been taken more seriously. Uh, and he loved to goad the southern states by, by proposing the abolition of slavery. But I, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, you, you, uh, you know more about, I think, than, than, than I do. I'd have to go back and look, at, look up. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. There's no, nobody reported any detail about what went on in that committee.
Sam? This is just going back to something you said sort of towards the beginning, um, comparing the situation of the, uh, of the United States before the Constitution and the, um, and the European Union today. And I wonder, this is maybe just a more of a kind of a meta question or a theoretical question. What do you, I mean, how much do you think we can learn from that comparison? Um, you know, about two different questions maybe. So one, whether a stronger EU would be a good thing for the world or for the for the individual countries involved or for for Europe and maybe yeah. a second question you know if if we decide that it's good how it might be achieved yeah. no that's a good question I, I actually attended a uh, a, uh, a meeting uh, held by CSIS which is a Washington think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies they invited a bunch of European um, politicians academics uh, maybe 30 came to Williamsburg and uh, uh, to meet and discuss these issues. This was last spring. And I was invited to come and talk about the American experience just because it, for contrast. And, and it was fascinating. I mean, the EU has a real problem, which they're quite aware of, that they don't have any popular roots. And as I say, they tried and failed, and they don't dare try again cannot afford to try and fail. I mean, they pulled it out immediately as soon as the French turned it down and the Dutch. I mean, the Irish are one thing. It's a small peripheral country, but the original states turning it down. So it's, it's hovering there without having any roots. And that is exactly what Madison uh, wanted to avoid. Uh, and they know the European Union people are aware of it. I mean, the European Union is in the process of, of changing rapidly. Um, the Brits will probably go out. Um, Cameron has promised to have a referendum. I mean, the, the, the notion is you, there's a Eurozone, as you know. And that is, those people are really insistent on, you've got to join that or forget it. There's that kind of pressure. This came out in this discussion. I, I mean, I'm not a, a scholar of contemporary events, so I just read the newspapers, but I did have that exp experience. And the, the Germans are really quite insistent on the Eurozone being in control. And I think this is going to push the, the Brits out. And then it'll be a very different kind of thing. Um, but the, the idea is if you could really have a, a centralized European Union, then you could have um, more of uh, acting more like a real government. I don't know where that's going to, whether that's going to happen or not. I think there's too much mistrust, too much loyalty to the individual states. I mean, people still think of themselves as Frenchmen or Germans or Brits. They don't think of themselves as Europeans. Now, Americans had that problem, too. I mean, as I say, people started with, I'm a Virginian. I'm a, I'm a citizen of Massachusetts. Um, very difficult to get them to think in terms of being Americans. And that, that is a major issue that they all face through the whole early decades. The War of 1812 becomes very crucial in kind of Americanizing people. Beating the British once again was, they saw, they thought they won the War of 1812. And of course it looked that way with, with uh, Jackson's victory at New Orleans, even though that occurred after the peace treaty. Um, but through those early decades, the, it, it was problematic. How, how, how do you build a nation in getting feeling? Especially if you had a large proportion of the people, the Federalists, in, um, in New England who were, not to put too fine a point on it, they were committing treason. During the War of 1812, the governor of Massachusetts is in, was colluding with, with, with the Canadian officials willing to, to give up territory in Maine to Canada in return for, um, for certain shipping navigation benefits. I mean, this was treason. Uh, Madison's government stayed away from making any trouble because he thought the things will work out and they'll be, they'll, they'll be uh, embarrassed in the end. And that's, of course, what happened. But there were lots of people, Federalists, who felt that England, that they, they had made a mistake. The revolution had been a great error and that they should go, go back. That England, when they saw the alternative as Napoleonic France, they said, we're on the wrong, we, we're on the wrong side. We, we should be fighting with, the, with our, our fellow Englishmen fellow Brits against uh, Napoleonic France. 
So it was a really interesting period there. I think there was much more Americanness because they had gone through the revolution. That experience uh, was searing. I mean, uh, 100,000 men or so, maybe 200,000, experienced war. And all sections of the country experienced war at one time or another. There were 25,000 ca- uh, deaths, not casualties, deaths. That's 1% of the population. That's, a, that's the largest losses in any war in our history except for, of course, the Civil War, where both sides were Americans. But you know, that, by today's standards, what would that be? Three million people killed. So 25,000 died of a population of 2.5 million. So people experienced the war, and it was the glorious cause, and it, it gives them a sense of being American. Without that, I think the country wouldn't have held together. It was that experience that seared into them the sense that we'd gone through something together. And, and all parts of the country had experienced it. Um, see, the Europeans haven't had that. They had World War II, which, uh, and, and they didn't want the French and Germans to go to war again. Uh, so the EU became a kind of protective. But, but it's, it's, it doesn't have the same holding power. As you can see, it, it, it's slowly building a, you know, a bureaucracy, and they're making all kinds of decisions about what kind of beer you can have and <laughs> what kind of you can sell or what kind of cheese you can sell. I mean, it, it, they're moving piecemeal, trying to consolidate, and it's, it's an irritant and to many people. And, and it's not, there's no emotional appeal, uh, Europeanness. Gordon, if just on this just on this point, if if North Carolina and and uh, New Hampshire had been the first two states to hold ratifying conventions, wouldn't we have been in very much the same position as the EU was? I, no, I don't think so. I, I think that um, it, it, it's true. North Carolina did not. New Hampshire, uh, they, the Federalists were very shrewd politicians. They saw that they didn't have a majority in the ratifying convention, so they adjourned and sent the representatives back to the town, and they came back. Uh, Rhode Island, of course, didn't even come to the convention. Rhode Island was so localist that they weren't going to. No, I, I don't think it would have made, because they were not, North Carolina was not a central state. I mean, if Virginia had turned down the Constitution, that would have been a real crisis. Or New York, because uh, it's so centrally located. Or Pennsylvania, those would have been. Um, so it was, and if you've read you know, Pauline Mayer's book, you realize how, how close it was in New York. Three votes, I think, in New York. And it's only a, less than a dozen votes or something in Virginia, I can't remember. That's not, you know, it's not overwhelming. It, the only states that really were quick in were Georgia and Delaware and Connecticut. They're small and they, they just needed, especially the, Georgia needed the, the, the Union because they got enemies on the South, the Spanish and Indians. Um, but the, the, the main, the main force, I think, in, in making for ratification, ultimately, is that the, the alternative was, was was not there. There was not much you could. You, there was you, it was no going back, so to speak, to the Confederation. Uh, it was dissolving, and people realized that. And I think, as I said, I quoted Lee on that, and he he just he's, he's frustrated. He says it's this or nothing. That's not a that's not a proper alternative. Um, and, and I think in the end, that's what counts more than anything. That most Americans did not want a breakup of the Union. That, in that sense, the, the war had been a, 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 a stable, or a, how do I put it, a, a collectivizing experience that carried through a, a long way until the last, well, it carries through to today. I mean, it, the, the whole notion of, of the Declaration of Independence and, and what, it, what the revolution means to us. It is the unifying force in our ideology. Uh, as important as the Civil War is, and of course it, it saved the Union, but that that Declaration of Independence, the notion uh, that we are a, a special people, uh, comes out of the revolution. And, and given the diversity of the country and increasing diversity, it has got to be the adhesive because there's nothing else. I mean, you know, McDonald's or, uh, or Starbucks can't be the unifying force. What, what do we got? We haven't got uh, the kind of, of things that the experience of a of uh, say the Germans or the or the British, with their history, that acts they just know what it is to be a Frenchman. Of course, they have a great deal of problems handling immigration, 
um, we think we have an immigration problem is pales into insignificance compared to the problem the Europeans are facing and will face through the rest of this century as we have invasion from the south. Uh, it's hard for the French to really admit that those Arabs from Algeria who've been there for what, three or four generations are really French. They just can't, we, we, we know we have problems, but they, they really do dissolve. People intermarry. I mean, I was at El Paso a couple of years ago, and that's a city totally dominated by Hispanics, a mayor and the head of the university there, they're all Hispanic, and they're thoroughly American. Uh, and that happened, and, and, and it can happen, and there's going to be problems, there's always problems in assimilating uh, foreign people, immigrants. We've had it from, from the beginning. But uh, we're able to do it because there's no ethnicity to our Americanness. They used to be, in the, in the 19th century, they were called Anglo-Americans. But in the 20th century, that's all disappeared. There's no real ethnicity to, to being American. What, do, what does it mean to be an American? To believe in certain things. And what are those certain things? The things that came out of the revolution. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, equality. Those beliefs are what hold us together. Uh, so I think it, it, the revolution is still the adhesive force for, for us. Uh, the guy in the middle there. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You. Oh. Let, why don't we go here first oh, and I then see. back here? He, so. he, he, he had his hand up earlier. Yeah. No, I, no you. you were the one. You had All raised right. your hand earlier. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, to, to what extent was the, uh, the, 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 the debate we saw over ratification, to what, to what extent did anything like that occur during the um, build up to the Constitutional Convention itself and the selection of delegates? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about what happened in Pennsylvania before the break. Um, were, were, were the supporters of the status quo, those who were sort of would become anti-federalists, did they organize in any way to try to affect the selection of delegates to the Constitution, Constitutional Convention? Did they sort of foresee what was going to happen? Or, um, and and if, they, if they didn't, that seems to me to have been a sort of, you're, you're looking for this pivotal moment, yeah. this quickening moment in the 1780s. It seems to me as though that might be a plausible candidate for explaining why this happened, well, happened that's so good, quickly. Well, those are good questions. And uh, to give a short answer, no, they didn't do much. I mean, there is this, I give you an example of, of Finley, who became an avid anti-federalist and, and an avid Jeffersonian Republican. But he, you know, he just didn't think big things were going to happen. So they're going to go off, these rich people, they can afford to stay in Philadelphia. I mean, they're supporting themselves. You know, they're staying in hotels for four months, inns or hotels, and, and they're, they're not being given any money by anybody. They're all well-to-do people. It's a loaded convention, and uh, these anti-federalists like Finley thought that, well, they're going to go and they're going to patch up this problem, but they didn't expect. I don't believe they expected. And there isn't much to go. I don't know how each of the delegations was, was selected. It, probably people came forward and said, I'd be willing to go, because it's going to be a, an onerous task to meet. Of course, they don't know it's going to be four months. Uh, and of course, that is a much more elitist society than, than we have. I mean, it's much more, generally speaking, uh, organized uh, in the certain expectation that certain gentlemen would be the ones, it's amazing that people like Finley were able to survive because they didn't have an outside income. They had to live off of whatever the state legislature was paying them. Uh, there are certain, you know, this, uh, Franklin makes this one major proposal in the convention, which when you think about it is extraordinary because he's supposed to be known as a Democrat, <coughs> small d. You know, he says uh, all members of the executive branch from the president on down should serve without pay. Think about that. If that had stayed in, <laughs> I mean, uh, Washington had a hard enough time getting to fulfill his cabinet uh, because people didn't want to go to, uh, to to Philadelphia and live. They didn't have it. It wasn't being paid enough. He had to go to the, you know, after Jefferson retired, he had to go to his seventh choice for his secretary of state. I mean, it, it, it was a a burden to, to serve in office. And uh, so 
it's understandable. The Anafellers just simply assumed that these people in Philadelphia were going to um, were going to just patch up the Confederation, and they weren't opposed to that. I don't think there's any great opposition at that point, because you had this enormous debt that for coming out of the Revolution owed to particularly not only to your own citizens but but to the French and Dutch, and it's embarrassing not being able to pay that. And so I think there's an expectation that the government does need to have an income. Uh, it's going to for, take the form of a, maybe a 5% tariff on no, 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 no great burden. But they just didn't plan on what they got. I, I, I don't believe it. They're all shocked. So, you know, they're just stunned by the thing. It comes out and suddenly they've got to debate this thing. And it, it's really a, a surprise to many people. They just hadn't kind of calculated it. But it's difficult since the, suddenly there's no alternative. The Congress has stopped meeting, the Confederation Congress. And so you're debating, and, and the Ampifellas, back of their minds is, if this fails, what do we got? Can we go back? And I think in the end, that, that counted for a lot. That's my take on it. Over here? Yes, there was somebody. Thank you. I have a very stupid question. No. <laughs> I am not the expert in the field. I totally amateur. And I read this article by Nora Hennigan, The Imperfect Constitution. Yes. Let us bring some light the modern context of the Constitution. Do you think? The Constitution is perfect for today's world. <laughs> well, <laughs> let, let me finish my oh, comments. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the reason of this question I'm asking, even the founding fathers made comments, Madison or Jefferson, that every 15 or 20 years, Constitution needs to be revised or amended by the Congress. Now. Let me give the context back uh, back during Nehru's uh, being the first prime minister after independence. One of his critics said, while nationalizing the newspaper media, he was very liberal. He was very what? Liberal. He said, yeah, it is all okay. open liberal. and public and whatever. But he wanted to control the radio. The reason, the reason he said, you see, the illiteracy, illiteracy rate of India was very high. So his theory was, you read, I write. And you write, I read. That means the rest of the population does not understand what is going on. But radio, everybody listens. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to kind of control or nationalize this thing. So in the context of today's world, our constitution, if it is not perfect, what are the elements of the constitution you think need to be amended? Because two things bother me quite a bit as a social uh, thinker. One is like... There are a lot of American being terrorists. American what? Being terrorists. Okay. Citizen. Okay. The other thing, gun control. So I would like to understand your feeling on those areas. If it is for. Is he talking? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you want to talk about. Literacy, the Americans were probably the most literate people in the late, in the Western world in the late 18th century. Now, okay. Uh, constitutional literacy? Yeah. How much of the Constitution do they understand? Oh, well, probably as much as, uh, as people understand what's going on today. And, you know, they, the level of, of knowledge of American citizens, if you ask them about what's, what's this, what's that, is very, very poor. And so maybe you actually read Pauline Mayer's book, and it's extraordinary 
little town in Massachusetts with, you know, 300 citizens, men, meeting, and they would debate for, um, you know, maybe for three weeks on this Constitution. And, and they're not educated people. I mean, they're not Harvard graduates or anything. And they finally met and they delivered their vote. No. Uh, it's extraordinary the extent to which ordinary folk were getting involved to an extent probably greater than our own uh, in terms of, of percentage of the population. Uh, now, I mean, the Constitution, of course, is not perfect. Uh, how could it be, how could any institution, it's changed so much. I mean, we, we don't have, I mean, we have an unwritten Constitution. There's nothing about the regulatory agencies in the Constitution. Most of what goes on in our government is, is part of a, a convention, custom, it's developed. A Constitution is what, what 8,000 words if you count the, the, the amendments? It's a very thin document, and, and we, we fill it in. We filled it in with 200 and, what, 30, 40 years of, of experience. Uh, I mean, we have all kinds of problems. Log the Congress at loggerheads and so on. Well, we, we made a very important decision with our separation of powers, which, mean, which meant we did not go down the English path. Very self-consciously, the English stumbled into parliamentary government. That is to say, Today, David Cameron's cabinet must, must hold a seat in the parliament, either the House of Lords or the House of Commons. And if that person loses his seat, he, can't, he cannot serve in the cabinet. But we have the exact opposite. Hillary Clinton becomes Secretary of State. She can't remain as senator from New York. She has to give up that seat. In England, she had to remain as a senator or she couldn't hold office. And if you had a parliamentary si system, John Boehner would be prime minister, right? I mean, <laughs> that, that, we didn't go down that path. The English stumbled into their parliamentary system. We thought it was corruption, and there was a good deal of corruption. The ministry would manipulate members. They would build support. They controlled maybe a third of the House of Commons by offering offices and all kinds of other rewards. They couldn't control the whole house, so they had to be careful. But they did pick off. We decided in the state constitutions that we would absolutely prohibit anyone from serving in the executive branch who, and si who was simultaneously holding a seat in the legislature. That's, that was the decisive decision that sent us, that split the Anglo-American tradition. We went down one path, and they went down another. And we're, we're suffering the consequences of this. Now, Woodrow Wilson and others through the years have suggested, I mean, John, uh, John, uh, uh, Burns, uh, who just uh, recently died, the political scientist, said he kept pleading through the 50s and 60s, we should go to a parliamentary system. Well, it was never, it's not going to happen, I, I don't believe. That's too, too big a change. Uh, so we're stuck with what we got. And it, it was built in, separation of power. So you're going to have loggerheads. You're going to have stalemates. They feared power, and so they feared power so much that they made it difficult to do anything. That's what we got. I, I'm not in despair over this. We'll work it out somehow. Uh, part of it is, has to do with, uh, you know, Jefferson said no bill should ever, no important bill, an important matter, should rest on a slender majority. Well, I think a good deal of the opposition of the Republicans, this is my own view as a, a newspaper reader, uh, rests on the opposition to Obamacare because they, they, it was totally you know, engineered by the one party. It was a mistake, I think, on their part because they've got deep opposition to that uh, and that's causing a good deal of the problems. That will disappear in time uh, if the Republicans win. They think they're not probably going to have to whittle away at it. But that was one of the causes of the immediate problem. The Republicans are really angry. Uh, and, you know, there is a problem when you thrust something through the legislature. As Jefferson said, nothing important should ever rest on a slender majority. We were talking about the Scottish vote. You know, if, this, if the Scots had gone independent, say, 51 percent, is that the way you make a decision of that momentous occasion? You know, 51 percent and 49 percent suddenly don't count? I mean, it should have been a two-thirds majority if you're going to make, you know, become independent in that way. But they were going to, 
they were going to rest with 50, 51%. Um, doing things that way is dangerous. And I think the Democrats made a mistake with doing that. But that's the only way they could get it through. They had to get it through fast, too, because Senator Brown was about to take office, and he would have stymied, and nothing would have happened. So they had to go fast, and so they got a lot of problems, and it should have been cleared up by subsequent legislation. Now they can't do that because they don't control the House, as they did at that time. I mean, those are problems of contemporary politics. You're all familiar with that. I'm just talking about newspaper kind of reading. But, uh, so that, that's not, I'm an 18th century historian, so I can't really have any authority to talk about we, it. We have two short questions, uh, yeah. Dev and Connor. Okay. Um, I just had a quick question going off your earlier comments on separation of powers. Um, I think, I'm not entirely sure that the one exception to this is that in the Constitution, the Vice President is also supposed to be head of the Senate. I remember reading it, that was particularly a controversial position, um, provision, and so I was wondering if you could just briefly speak to why they chose to put that exception to the sep general separation of powers. Yeah, uh, it, it is a, a, a violation. I think they, they didn't know what to do with this vice president. What's he supposed to do? Uh, did you really need it? Um, there were lieutenant governors, and so they had that, uh, but there is no, well, there is an heir to the king, and so I guess they thought it in those terms. But they wanted to have him do something, and so they made him president of the Senate. Now, most, in most cases, uh, since uh, in modern times, that doesn't come into play, except if there's going to be a close vote in the Senate. Then, the, then uh, Biden would show up to make sure that they, they have the, the votes, because he, he can only vote when there's a tie. John Adams, however, took it, his position quite seriously, and he, he engaged in debate. He was one of the senators. He was the president of the Senate, the head of the Senate. Uh, I don't think they gave it a lot of thought. I just think they threw that in. They certainly didn't think, when they talked about separation of powers, they really were concerned about not duplicating the English experience, which would be that all members of the ministry have to be members of the legislature. And that was what they were going to stop. Now, in this case, uh, they did give this. It is a kind of minor violation, but nothing that, as far as I know, anyone raised said, this is a violation of our separation of powers. They, as far as I know, nobody. Uh, it might come out. It might have come out in the ratifying debates. I don't know. There were much more substantial issues being debated than that. I, I, just on on that issue, on the, in the ratifying debates, it did come up at one or two occasions, and it had to do with the necessity for having a majority and not having a tie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In Congress, that's with a, two senators. That's a good point. If you had equal number of senators, you could have a tie, and how are you going to break that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so I had a question um, where you're discussing the Articles of Confederation. <coughs> um, you mentioned that the the Congress or the convention didn't go in specifically with the idea to throw out the Articles of Confederation. Um, so I was wondering, um, was it like the change in purpose precipitated because of just like the fatigue of discussing the Articles of Confederation um, until they until the delegates realized that there wasn't really a better solution than to just write a new document or um, do you think there were some people with an underlying motive, like Madison, to change uh, the structure of the government entirely? Oh, yeah. Madison comes in with his Virginia plan. That's not uh, uh, an amendment. He said, we're not going to amend them. We're, we're going to have a total overhaul. I mean, we're throwing out. They just, it never was, it wasn't considered in the opening days. Now, the, as you know, the Virginia plan, plan is so radical so different from what many people expected that it does mount. There is an opposition uh, coming led by the New Jersey delegation, uh, and they proposed what was called the New Jersey Plan, which is actually a series of amendments that would have been more in accord with what people outside had expected. Now, I don't believe, and this is how you, it's hard to read uh, the politics of these things, because you don't get the full story of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, these people from New Jersey and elsewhere who supported the New Jersey plan uh, aren't real anti-federalists. They're nationalists, just like the Virginia plan supporters. But they don't want as radical a position. So they need to come up with something that's different to 
kind of work out a compromise, which is exactly what happened. Uh, now, Hamilton gives this long speech when the two plans, Virginia plan and New Jersey plan, are uh, up there for, for consideration. And he, this is when he gives his, what, five-hour speech where he says, well, we're going to have to, we can't yet go to a hereditary system, but we're going to have senators for life, president for life. And he offers, this is what we should have. Now, what, what he, I, I do believe that he, he didn't expect that to happen. But what he was trying to do, if you think about the tactics, political tactics, these guys are politicians. They're very shrewd. He's trying to, as he says, I'm, this is what we got, not like the, the self-same pork. This is the phrase he uses. Throwing the Virginia plan and the lumping the Virginia plan with the New Jersey plan as being the same. This is what we should have. This made the Virginia plan seem more moderate, if you think about the politics in the minds of his listeners. That was his reason for this long speech. He didn't intend, he didn't expect people to expect. What he wanted to do was get people accustomed to the Virginia plan because it's not so radical as my plan, and therefore it's moderate. And in the end, of course, they voted uh, in mid-June for, that's the crucial vote, they vote for the Virginia plan as they're working, and the New Jersey plan is, is gone. It's just thrown out, and it's never, the only issue remains, of course, is the proportional representation. And that, that continues right through. Now, once the state, once the Virginia plan, uh, or the Connecticut compromise uh, is, is voted, Madison and the other nationalists who had wanted proportional representation are very upset. You know, the, at that point, the, the, uh, the Senate had enormous power. The president had no power to appoint diplomats or judges. This is exclusively going to be the power of the Senate. Uh, it's going to appoint all diplomats and all, without presidential approval, no president involved. Suddenly, the Connecticut Compromise occurs, and Madison and the Nationalists say, uh-oh, we can't have the Senate having that kind of power because uh, suddenly the states are going to be uh, having, having control of these senators. And, and at that point, the, the exclusive power to appoint diplomats and exclusive power to appoint judicial officers is now shared with the president. The president's given the power with the consent, two-thirds of the Senate. That, that happens. So it gives you an idea of how well this debate went on. Uh, people changed their minds. It, suddenly, Madison et al. and the other nationalists were frightened of the Senate, this new Senate. It's going to be state-oriented, and they had to take some power away from it. Um, that, but the original plan was to, uh, was to give exclusive power to, those, to the senators uh, of, of, of those two uh, functions, diplomats and, and judges. Um, and in the end, you know, there's a great deal of, Madison's letters are full of despair. And Washington's supposed to have walked out saying this thing won't last 20 years. I mean, they really weren't all that confident. Um, but they made the best effort. And uh, um, the next decade, Washington's role, of course, is crucial in this. You can't, I mean, he stood, it's unfortunate that we've had this President's Day instead of Washington's birthday, because Washington stood head and shoulders over the others, in their eyes, not just literally, but figuratively, because he, he just had a, a position that we forget. We kind of lump all these founders together, but no, they didn't. Washington was way, way ahead. He didn't say much in the convention. In fact, as far as I know, he said nothing until the very end. And he, he asked, he says, well, I think, uh, 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 30,000 uh, basis for representation is too, too few. We should go to 40,000. Kind of trivial point. It's because it never wasn't even applicable. But it was his way of signaling to the delegates, look, make this little change and I'm with it. I, I mean, because you know, during the debates, if he had ever said anything, no one would know how to start to refute him, to oppose him. He had that kind of position. And he knew it, and so he held back. It wasn't that he hadn't got ideas about them. He just stood so far above them with this. And, and as, as the first president, he really uh, keeps the union together, almost literally. He is a kind of uh, king. Um, I mean, uh, this new book by, uh, by Nelson is making a lot of this. But they, we've known this for a long time. They all thought that they, the country needed a kind of surrogate king because they've been used to royalty. and so. 
and, and Washington is willing to play the role up to a point, but he, he's a little scared. I was telling Mike, I think I was telling you earlier, that he, uh, his inaugural address he wrote out for himself at first. Uh, we only have fragments left, but he says in it, look, my fellow citizens, don't fear me. I have no heirs. I'm not going to start a dynasty. And, and you know, in other words, he's sort of well aware of the, the feelings out in the public. And, and he shows it to Madison. Madison says, you've got to take that out. You can't say that. But the, the feelings that people had that he would be, uh, Jefferson assumed that he would serve for life. And then when he died, the vice president would become president. And that president would serve for life like a Polish king. Uh, and that was the expectation. That there is a lot of uh, monarchy built into our Article II. Uh, how much, uh, you know, we can see now it's a debate. Does the president have prerogative powers? I mean, uh, Obama's got uh, his ideas about executive authority that he's pressing to the limit, uh, as many presidents have, through especially in wartime conditions. Uh, with good reason, they, they, many people were suspicious of this president. But Washington, as many said, I would never have voted for this. Uh, this they were members of the convention. I would never have voted for this Constitution with that Article II single president if it hadn't been uh, my knowledge that George Washington would be the, there wasn't any doubt that he was going to be the holder of it. Um, I've, got, I've got James, Ruth, George, and Aaron. Um, you, you've focused thus far mostly on the political legacy of the ratification debates, the deba debates at the convention, um, and I was hoping uh, you could um, potentially focus a little bit um, now on the legal legacy of those debates. Um, you, there's a Supreme Court justice that will read um, those debates and will use that to explicitly interpret the meaning of parts of the Constitution. Um, we know it has a very significant impact on a lot of right. current constitutional debates. So I was just wondering, how should those debates, um, and broadly the making of the Constitution, um, condition how we view the Constitution as a legal document today? Well, of course, I'm, I'm a historian, not a um, judicial analyst or, or, or a constitutional lawyer. Or, uh, and you're talking about originalism. Uh, of course, that there's a variety of meanings to that. In, in one sense, all of the justices are originalists in the sense they, they probably start out by looking at the Constitution, <coughs> but uh, they aren't wedded to any particular uh, part of it, and nor are they, you know, Scalia is a, he's a peculiar kind of originalist. He's a textualist. As you know, he, he doesn't believe in looking at the debates. He doesn't care about the debates. He says that history is, is irrelevant. I just want to know what does the word mean? Uh, and in the 18th century. Uh, so he's uh, much more interested in, the, in that kind of text. Now, it's Thomas who's interested in, uh, you know, he's the most thoroughgoing originalist, and he, he's interested in the, what do they mean and what were the debates, and he'd be, he'd be more interested in reading the uh, ratification debates uh, and, and looking at the history behind a particular uh, uh, you know, phrase or something in the, in the Constitution. Scalia does not, so there's a difference. All of them, I think, want to start with the Constitution. They know, you know, no one gets up and says, well, what shall the law be today? You know, they, they, they all want to start. And many of their decisions are unanimous. Now, obviously, they have a problem when they're trying to deal with I don't know, modern communications and social media and so on. There's nothing in the Constitution. So they have, you know, obviously, they're bringing to bear uh, their uh, legal expertise as much as they can, but they their own interpretations of what they want the law to be uh, play a role. I, you know, as a, somebody, uh, as I say, I'm speaking just as a citizen look, who reads the newspapers like the rest of you, and I have no expertise in this matter. I do know they differ among themselves, and uh, they aren't as far apart. You see it on the five to four votes, which tend to be uh, seem to the layman like me, uh, you know, politically. But they try to put it into um, some kind of legal <laughs> framework. They're not just voting their, um, their interest, if you will, or their, their, they don't think they are. 
we know that maybe, you know, unconsciously or whatever, they, they have their own presumptions. Um, but, I, I, you know, I don't have any uh, uh, special insight into how the law should be interpreted. Uh, that uh, we have, I mean, we th we're talking, I was talking at the break with someone that the, the amendments did not apply to the states, you know, uh, until the 20th century. Um, they applied only to the federal government. So the states could have an established church, as they did. The Massachusetts did until the 1830s. Uh, the, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. They could, uh, if they wanted to, unless it had their own constitution, had a, had a, uh, a, a right, so a Bill of Rights, uh, they could create uh, established churches, or they could have a bridge freedom of speech and various things they could do. The Bill of Rights didn't apply. That came about in, in the 1920s. Judges began uh, using the 14th Amendment, interpreting the 14th Amendment, and, and reaching through it and incorporating the Bill of Rights and applying many of them, not all of them, but many of them to the states. And now it's so firmly established that there's no going back from this doctrine of incorporation. Some of you probably know about that. Uh, it is judicially based only. There's no amendment to the Constitution. Uh, I remember hearing Scalia give a talk probably three or four years ago at George Washington University Law School, and somebody asked him from the from the uh, audience, uh, "Do you, Justice Scalia, do you believe in the doctrine of incorporation?" And uh, he had this long pause. He's got a you know quite a great sense of timing, and he, he's, he can be very funny. He says, "Look, he says I'm an originalist, I'm a textualist, but I'm not an idiot." Uh, and he says, 70 plus years, uh, I'm not about to turn that around. Now, his colleague Thomas, I think, would. I don't think he believes in the doctrine of incorporation, but uh, some of you may know more about these judicial decisions. Uh, but it is an extraordinary moment, because it's all judicially determined that the Bill of Rights, including you know, separation of church and state and uh, freedom of speech and all those things uh, are applied to the states now only because judges decide it. It's never been decided by any constitutional amendment, but it's been decided by 70 plus years of experience. And that's what Scalia's point is. You don't roll that back. Thomas might do that. I mean, he's a, he's a real radical. Uh, and you make a mis people make a mistake if they think Thomas is somehow going in the wake of, of uh, living in the wake of, of Scalia. It, it, in many cases, it's the other way around. Th Thomas is the, by far the more forceful of the two original, uh, major originalists. Of course, uh, most of them, the majority at least, are religious originalists to one extent or another. But it's, you know, they, they would look for, it depends on, they would look for evidence as best they could. You saw this big debate over gun control. Someone mentioned that. Um, Second Amendment. And scholars have debated it. And, you know, there is this, it's an awkward phrase. They, it sounds like the militia should be the ones that could carry guns. And that was the reason why guns. And that was used by contemporaries who were opposed to, uh, to, to having the population have guns. But, you know, that debate w w was incomprehensible to these people. They wouldn't understood the distinctions we made between the militia or an individual right to hold guns. They just wouldn't understood that. If you want to be historically honest, they simply was beyond their comprehension. They just never do, drew that distinction. Uh, people had guns and, and other people didn't. But they had militia, but it wasn't, they didn't have, allow people to have guns only because they were in the militia. They just, they just had no thought that people couldn't own a gun. So the, the distinction that was drawn by scholars in the most precious ways, uh, debates that went on for, for years before the court finally made a couple of decisions, um, was, would, would have been beyond their consciousness. It, it was a distinction that was our distinction, not theirs. That's what happens. I mean, you have to make, you try to make the best case you can. If you're, I'm not a lawyer, but that's what you do when you're, I guess. Uh, if you've got a client that you needs defense, you make the best case you can. Uh, this Rick. working. Thank you. I want to go back to this, a point that you were making earlier about the importance to this whole story of Madison's 
fear of abuse of power on the yes. part of the states. Yes. Do you think that that was a reasonable judgment on his part? Or what is the sort of historian's assessment of how badly the states were actually doing their job? Well, not everybody agrees with the emphasis that I put. As I said, Ed Morgan, very late in his life, said, well, I think most people start with the assumption that uh, the Confederation wasn't working and therefore it had to be changed. And I say, yeah, that's true. But Madison goes beyond what most people expected. And the reason he goes beyond is because he's really scared of this excess of democracy. He, he thinks his problem is, how do you maintain a Republican government, or we should call it a Democratic government, because that, that's what he, that, the modern meaning, it, it, which is based on majority rule, if you can't trust the majority. Uh, if the majority abuses its power and uh, endangers minority rights, you, you've got a problem. Now, this is a very important contemporary problem. I mean, the problem that um, General, um, uh, not General, but um, uh, Morsi, President Morsi ran into with the, with the um, uh, Islamic Brotherhood is that he was in control but he, was, the, his, he and his legislature were abusing their majority rule. And uh, Madison realized that the normal solution, which the ancients would have agreed with, that is going back to the Greeks, if you have a raging democracy, you've got to counter that with a dose of monarchy. And that is the conventional solution, which, of course, the Egyptians have done. Sisi comes in, and, and now we're back to Mubarak, Two, if you will. Uh, the Americans, the U.S. government is very embarrassed by this and is just not raising the issue. We, we, it's just an embarrassment. Because we're ha actually happy, I think, with CC because, first of all, the Israelis are happy with him. And uh, he's calming things down, and we're back to where we were with Mubarak. I mean, we're building up a relationship. That, and, but it's undemocratic. There's just no doubt of what happened. Morsi was elected as fairly as any, any officer, any president in Egyptian history was elected, but he abused the power. Madison is, realizes that, but he doesn't want to go in that direction, the monarchical direction. He says, I want a Republican remedy for Republican ills. So how do you devise a government based on majority rule that protects minorities? This is the major problem of the Middle East. I mean, you know, dictators protect minorities. Assad protects the, the, the minorities. In, in, as much as we dislike him, they were better off under him than they're going to be under any, um, in, any uh, Shiite control, uh, uh, Sunni control. Uh, and, and that was true of the Coptic Christians under Mubarak. And that's true of the Coptic Christians under Sisi. Uh, but, so that was the problem he faced. How do you, and he says this, over and over again. And he says it to Jefferson in his letters. How are we going to protect minorities in a government that's based on majority rule? And, and I just think that's the most fundamental issue that's facing governments today. It's facing the Middle East. We faced it. He faced it. And he came up with a solution that may not be perfect, but we've stumbled along. And we have quite a bit of protection for minority rights, individual liberties and minority rights, because the majority is frustrated constantly can't do what it would like to do. Now, I don't think it's just the Constitution. The English have a much more totalitarian system, if you will. Uh, there's nothing limiting Parliament uh, except its own conventions and customs, because Parliament's sovereign. It can, do, it can do away with habeas corpus tomorrow. It did. It did in Northern Ireland. It, it just said, habeas corpus doesn't apply. Nobody, no court could overturn that. There's no judicial review. Uh, in England, although there is the beginnings of it, because some judges are beginning to appeal to the treaties of human rights that the English have signed into, and using those to limit Parliament, which is it's so slight and so gingerly started. But until that's, they don't have a written constitution that they can, the judge can say, look, you Parliament have violated this. Parliament's sovereign; it can do what it wants. Now, the only thing that limits them is, is, of course, the conventions. People would be in outrage. But they can have hate laws and all kinds of violations of, of, of free speech that we would just not, our Constitution would not let us get away with, or our judges interpreting the Constitution would not let us get away with. Uh, 
we're stuck with this, but I think Madison saw the problem acutely, and, and I think he put his finger on it. How do you do that without you know, st still keeping a democratic system and limit that democracy at the same time? It creates a frustrating situation, which we're experiencing, stalemating, frozen government, but uh, he's, it, it, it avoids what the, what the Middle East is going through right now. Short follow-up from Tom. Uh, it seems to me the, I mean, she was asking about other examples of states where I guess hyper democracy and all those turnover of immutability and um, injustice, the things that you were talking about. But for the most part, it seems to me it's it's your own state that was the poster boy for the, the Rhode Island. You mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Rhode Island. So, um, what are other states who s similarly were uh, in, engaged in the? I guess Rhode Island, you turned over your legislature something like every six months, right? Right. They had elections every. Every half year. Right. Uh, uh, or so was there anything, was anything beyond, I mean, does it devolve into the Beard thesis that the misbehavior was just not treating the creditor, creditors well? Right, or? exactly. They were passing emissions. Of course, Rhode Island has been doing, was doing that from the very beginning, in the 18th century. They had nine paper emissions, which led to the Currency Act by Parliament in 18, 1751, prohibiting states from making paper money legal tender. Uh, it was Rhode Island that was behind that, that created that pr problem. But they, as soon as they got independent, they, they just passed paper money after, emission after paper. And of course, creditors, most of the merchants in, in Providence or Newport were outraged. And in fact, in the end, you know, part of, uh, the, the convention meets, it's all the constitutions in business and Rhode Island's outside the union. Uh, North Carolina came in very quickly uh, but Rhode Island stays out till 91, I think, and, 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 and it's when Providence finally gets, the merchants get together and say, we're going to secede from the state uh, if you don't agree. And of course, the government was treating Rhode Island as, the, as a foreign power, and of course, it became impossible to stay out. But they, they were frightened of this far-removed power. They had a democratic, they are the most democratic state uh, in the measured by frequency of elections and, and lack of elite control. It really was ordinary farmers who were, it's a very commercialized state. People, this paper money is a big problem for historians. Um, and I had real, people assume that these debtors are people with their backs to the wall and they're poor debtors and they, you know, some kind of our, our usual idea of a victim, for oppressed victim who's, who's borrowed money and is in terrible shape. Well, people, why do people want paper money? They want paper money because they want to trade. They want commercial, not international trade. Big merchants don't want paper money because they can't give a, a note to a London merchant for something. Uh, who's going to take a state note? Uh, but what the uh, what the the, the uh, farmers want is is ability to trade with each other, and of course that's the secret. The somebody mentioned the cotton exports. Uh, this real secret to America's uh, boom first half of the 19th century is not international trade, which is the easiest thing to measure, exports and imports, but inter internal domestic trade. And that's fed by paper money. Now, and we, we scarcely understand it. Uh, the best books we have are books on counterfeiting, because <laughs> counterfeiters really flourished, because people wanted the money so badly they were willing to have counterfeit bills. Now, you know, the Article 1, Section 10 prohibits the states from printing paper money. That's one of the solutions to Madison's veto. His lack of veto, they gave him that instead. He's very unhappy with that. He just didn't think it was going to work. Well, if that had been effectively enforced, it would have frozen the America's economy. Because the real growth comes from domestic trade, which was not anticipated. Domestic trade was never valued. Read Montesquieu on it. He says the only commerce is defined as international trade. It's trade, if it's a kind of zero-sum mercantilist notion. You, you can only make money if you tr sell more than you buy, and, and that's the only way you're going to you grow your economy. But we know that's not true. Our economy is, is about three-quarters of it's dependent on, on 
domestic consumption, domestic trade. Well, they didn't appreciate that at first. It took a while. Uh, at any rate, the, the states get around this prohibition. They can't print paper money, but they charter banks, which can print paper money. And of course, the banks proliferate. There are hundreds of banks. Within a, a decade or two, there are hundreds of banks all over the country. And even that's not enough money. As counterfeit bills proliferate, and there's no there's reluctance to punish these counterfeiters, or they, they, some people don't want to punish them, but the, a lot of people want the bills. Now, you can imagine what a chaotic system it was, because you you're a guy in, uh, I don't know, New York, and you get a bill from the first bank of, of Tennessee, or Nashville or something. You, it's worth $100. What are you going to do with it? You can, it says on it, we'll bear, pay the bearer gold and silver upon demand. Well, you've got to go to Nashville to get the collector of gold and silver, so you probably discount it, and pass it on. And people did that. And they, this is how these notes flourished. Hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, perhaps. We don't know. It's hard to measure all this. But it was so difficult to be a merchant or a storekeeper that they would have these books where they would, you know, they get a note from some faraway place and they go through the book. Is this, can they trust this note or not trust it? It was that kind of business. It really was not very efficient. The most nationalizing moment in American history comes, of course, with the Civil War, but it's the creation of a national currency. We sort of reverse the EU. The EU creates the currency first and then <laughs> trying to build itself up based on the currency. We went for 70, 80 years without a national currency. Extraordinary. And once you get the national currency, in the aftermath of the Civil War, laws are passed prohib taxing the state bank bills, putting them out of business. And we develop a treasury office to go after the counterfeiters, and we're into modernity. We're almost within a decade or two following the war with a national currency that, that is, uh, puts all the state bills right out. There's no more state bills. Uh, that's an amazing moment. I, I've got four people left, and we've got about 18 minutes. Oh. So, so I think uh, if, it, I'll if try it's to be short. Sure. Well, I, I was going to say, I could just let all of them ask questions, and then you could you can just respond as you like. Well, I can't. My memory might be. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll. But go ahead. Okay. I don't care what you want to do. So we'll, I'll we'll try to be short. We'll, we'll start with George, and then I've got Aaron, Russ, and Chris. Uh, on, this, on, on this discussion, uh, which is I'd, I'd like you to go back to the very beginning uh, that you started with, in which you said you know, something awesome or awful happened in those in those 10 years to make make this constitution possible um, and and then you said well the, what one explanation for it is Madison and, and others like him were in his position perceived the, these excesses of democracy at the state level right. um, at the same time you also stress that Madison believed you needed to have popular roots popular legitimacy right. for the new constitution it's a very by the by those standards, very literate society, very widespread franchise. You gave us examples of right, sort of ordinary people engaged in, right. in the discussion over the, the ratification. And so uh, that, that leads me to wonder whether you could speculate a little bit about what it was, what that awesome and awful thing was. Because clearly it couldn't have just been elite perceptions of excesses of democracy if popular engagement with this process was so widespread and, uh, and, and important to Madison. Well, I think it could. It was. I mean, they just simply had not anticipated this rampaging democratic practices with so many laws being passed, contradictory laws, turnover of seats, interest groups pushing. It, it just... Well, oh, the people did, but the elites were very upset. This is an elite-engineered national coup, if you will. I mean, that's, that's harsh, but they, because it, they, they didn't do it. They had to get it popularly accepted. They had to get the consent of the ratifying. But the convention is a very engineered... Um, my, my question is about the consent. Like, how were they able to get that popular consent? Oh, because, well, then you read Pauline Mayer's book. It's, it's close. But the, the problem is that there's no alternative. And people, they don't want a breakup of the United States. That's the Federalists have that going for them. And they have... The alternative is just not there. It's, it's collapsing. The Confederation, they can't get a quorum anymore. There's just, there's no, the people who are aware of, like Melanchthon Smith in New York, 
really great anti-federalist. He, he's probably the you know, federal farmer that great anti-federalist uh, pamphlets, two, two, two pamphlets, most respected anti-federalist position. He, he, he doesn't want to end the United States. And so in the ultimately, even after debating for months with Hamilton and Livingston, he votes for the Constitution. So that, I think, is what happened. They, they simply got this thing out there, and you've got to take it or, or, or there's nothing. And so that was a political advantage. And, and Pauline's book shows how shrewd, the, in many cases, the Federalists were. They weren't shrewd in Pennsylvania. They tried to shove it through, and it backfires. And it made Massachusetts. She chose that what, what happened in one state affects the behavior in the other states. And it, it, she de develops a beautiful narrative out of that. But I think in the end, the, 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 the dream of being the United States is very strong because of the revolution. And suddenly, there's no alternative out there. But there's no doubt that the Virginia plan was fed by disgust and disillusionment with the state behavior. Uh, it ju they just were going crazy. In the eyes of, now we can look back, and some of the things Madison despairs of is, is you know, we, it's normal politics, log rolling and uh, all kinds of interest group finagling that he just found appalling. These people were not behaving as he thought they ought to, and he was worried about that. He thought this is this is this is democratic politics gone wild. That explains it. I think it's just the, the vices of the system. You read that essay; it's the most important document between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Much more important than the Articles of Confederation because it it really is his working paper explaining why we've got to make this overhaul federal system. And it is a real overhaul. Aaron? All right, so my question is very similar to the point where I'm questioning whether it might actually be redundant. But um, there seem to be two points that you're stressing um, whenever you, you're speaking. Is that One is that, to some extent, um, a reform and a radical reform of the Articles of Con Confederation, so therefore the creation of the Constitution, was almost inevitable uh, given the weakness of the Articles of Confederation and the sort of desperate state that um, the United States was in. And on the other hand, you seem to be also suggesting that um, far from being inevitable, it was an elitist coup, an elitist hijacking. And these two seem to be, to me, at least contradictory. No. And perhaps the final question that this whole line of questioning can come to is, what do you mean there wasn't an alternative? If this really was a federalist uh, sort of elite hijacking, then in the end, why wasn't their lawmakers saying, wait on, ho hold a minute, there, there, there is going back. We can go back and perhaps restore the Articles of Confederation with then the possibility of amending them in the proper non-radical way. So what do you, like, I, it just seems to be to be a non sequitur to, to suggest that many people, even anti-federalists, thought that there was no going back. Well, that's what they said, and they, there's some reality to it. It would have been very difficult to put back together the, uh, the Confederation. Now, if there'd been enough support uh, to do that, again, you have to realize the Federalists controlled 9 out of 10, 90 percent of the press. Uh, every el major elite, I mean, Washington's in favor of it, Franklin's in favor of it. It's very difficult for ordinary people, given that kind of pressure, to, to what's extraordinary. Now, if you had a modern referendum, the Constitution would have been defeated. There's just no doubt of that. But given the kind of, the way it was organized, the way the Federalists uh, did their politics, and that, that's what Pauline's book shows. Uh, and, and given the, the support of Washington and Franklin, it's a, I mean, I, I just think it's, uh, it's amazing that there was as much opposition as there was. It was as close as it was. I mean, you had to, took, you had to take a, you know, it took a lot of courage to, to, to oppose it, uh, given the kind of weight on the other side. I mean, the, there were very few Except in Virginia, there are very few aristocrats um, on the side of the, of the anti-federalists. Most of them were these middling sorts of people, uneducated. Finley gives, gives Wilson a hard time in the Pennsylvania Convention. He's a smart guy, too, uneducated, self-educated. Uh, and, and Smith is unbelievably smart. Read those New York debates. They're just wonderful. He really has Hamilton backing up and trying to... I'm not an aristocrat. I'm not a gentleman. No, we're all gentlemen. You know, he tries to. It's disingenuous. He can't really be honest. He doesn't believe that Smith is his equal. He went to King's College or Columbia. You know, what's Columbia? And this guy is uh, 
an ignorant guy, I mean, uneducated. He, but he can't say that. Uh, I mean, it, it's just a, it's extraordinary that there is as much opposition when you think of how the press, 90, 90%, 9 out of 10 papers support the Federalists. Um, it's, it's interesting when you, when you look at Massachusetts, you know, there's lots of farmers who've come to the convention. And e even then, it w might very well have failed, except that Samuel Adams and, and John Hancock come in, and Hancock's carried in wearing right. red, red underwear, suffering from gout, and, you know, and gives a speech in favor of ratification. I mean, what farmer is going to stand up and say to one of the wealthiest men in America and the governor of Massachusetts, you're, 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 you're wrong? I, I think it was very hard. that guy from Maine who does get up and say, Singletary is his name, and he says, you high-flying lawyers, you speak so, you're trying to, over, you know, he says this class distinction, the way you are trying to, to uh, bush, you know, he's really full of anger and, and that, at this elite trying to uh, steamroll them. And so there is a lot of uh, uh, class, if you want to use that term, uh, division over this. Uh, well, it's, 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 I mean, I don't know what else you can say except that uh, Madison was shrewd enough to realize that I mean, he's not a, when I use the term hijack, he thinks it's in the public interest to have a strong constitution to avoid these excesses, but he's not anti-democratic. He wants to save republicanism. As I say, Republican remedy for Republican ills. Very crucial statement by Madison in the Federalist Papers. That's driving them. He does not want to go down what would have been the normal route. Many do, you know, the, the number of people who suggest going to monarchy is very strong, it's buried. Historians are just discovering some of this in a private correspondence, particularly in New England. Now, one of the reasons they get H uh, Hancock into the convention, he's the former governor and he's the big shot in the, uh, and the governor, he, he, uh, he, they tell him, look, Virginia might not uh, ratify, and if not, you will become the president. Uh, because Washington couldn't be, you know, it's no longer uh, possible for Virginia to be a president if they're outside the Union. And that Lewis, Hancock had a big, Head, very ambitious. Uh, two last two questions, Chris and Russ. So why don't we? We'll just ask both of the. Chris, why don't you start, and then, okay, just Chris then, and then we'll. Be, we'll. Hey, yeah, with respect to campaign finance reform, which I'm interested in today. I'm sorry. If, with respect to campaign finance reform, are there any lessons we can draw from the history of the founding and the way in which they ran their own campaigns? Well, they didn't have that kind of money. I mean, but rich people, they they certainly didn't have. Uh, what we have today, tax and all that. Uh, but uh, no, they, they didn't electioneer. They didn't like to. I told you Madison was appalled uh, by, by the fact that he had to give a speech. Uh, but there was electioneering from the ordinary, you know, like the McClankton Smiths. They're the ones who begin organizing and, and you begin developing because that's the only way they can combat these uh, elites. And that, of course, is what happens over the next generation. I mean, Martin Van Buren is a crucial figure in democratizing America. He leaves the... He doesn't have the respect of the, uh, to the kind of respect we have for the founders that we have. I mean, he, he simply says, we've got to leave them behind. We're in a new ball game now. And it's a democratic ball game, and we've got to organize parties, and we've got to do all kinds of things that they could, it was beyond their ken. He really has a sense that he's progressing. Now, we look back with a kind of nostalgia to these people because they seem so different from our current politicians. And of course, they were. But they were gentlemen in a world where that really made something, and, and that's being contested at that moment. That's why the debates have this social, uh, especially in New York and Pennsylvania, have this social edge to them. Uh, they lived in a different world, but the, the electioneering is coming from the ordinary folk, from the Martin Van Burens, who, uh, who are leaving the founders behind, and they don't regret it. They don't, it's Lincoln who has a kind of interesting perspective on them. Uh, he too feels that we've moved beyond them. They can't, but they had something to say to, it, to him. But Van Buren seems much more, well, they, those guys were fine for their own time, but we're doing something different. And he, he was. He was the first, I think, major Democratic organizer. He built the Democratic Party in New York. Gordon, I, wanna, I, wa I think we're just about out of time. I want to just take the opportunity to thank all of you for coming. And I especially want to thank Gordon for being here. And, and this does bring us to the point where we could talk about the origin of parties, which is one of the subjects that Gordon deals with in his most recent book. So maybe we'll have to have him back to deal with uh, 
to deal with the origin of American political parties. Anyway, thank you all for coming, and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.